What's up, everyone? This episode of Power Spike is brought to you by, well, obviously, the three of us in different rooms. Dom back in NA. I'm back in the Wee Blair. If you see behind me, I'm back in Vegas. It's my friend's place. The shrine of Keanu Reeves is somewhere over here. And Monty's still uh, at his place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just in Korea, but you know, I, I'm not my normal place that I've been for the last six years. This is this is new and fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How was your flight back? Your trip back, Tom? Oh, it was pretty good. It was nice bad. and easy. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty easy. I would say the Newark Airport is crazy. I don't know if you guys have been through Newark Airport recently. Oh but yeah, like the way that they do it with like the multiple. Like now they they expanded it, so there's. You have to take a bus to like literally every single terminal or a train from every terminal to every other terminal. So I don't know. I've never actually had the setup that Newark terminal had where like you do the international flight, you go through security, right? And then when we got to Newark, we had to go through security again. Yep. What? Like, yeah. We had to go through security twice. That happens sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've never had that happen. Normally it's like you go through security and then you're done with security until... You know, you're off your 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 flight, but no, we went through security twice. We had to go to baggage claim, get our bags, and then recheck our bags, which was strange. But uh, yeah, I mean, overall, it was a good experience. All right, well, uh, nice to have you back. Hopefully, the European excursion was uh, refreshing, a good one. Uh, and yeah, we've got a, a little bit to cover. Breaking news that just broke on out, uh, or the rumor that's going around. Best of three coming to LCS. Now, this is something, Monty, that you have predicted for a while. What do you make of this change now, LCS, finally going back to best of three? Well, look, I mean, there are only eight teams now. And it, the, the problem is that it's going to probably be best of three single, you know, single round Robin, uh, which is a little bit boring. Like, I would rather have this be split into two GSL groups. So, like, two groups of four play best of threes through that double elimination and then kind of like mix up the groups again and then do it again. I think that would be a really fun format and a unique format to do that would be a little bit more exciting. Uh, but that said, best of threes. Now, everybody's going to complain and everybody was saying, well, oh, best of threes were so boring the last time they did it or viewership went down, but that's because they were running them simultaneously on two different streams. And when they stopped doing that, Riot fired Degon because they didn't need him anymore. Uh, That's true. <laughs> okay. Nice. Why, why am I catching a stray? What the fuck? <laughs> I, it's not, you're not catching a stray. You're catching facts. That's just what happened. That is, that is the history of best of threes. You are, you are interwoven into the history of best of threes, Degon. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, I, I don't think it's going to be the same thing this time. People will also complain, well, I don't want to watch a best of three between the two worst teams. I mean, objectively, guys, Shopify Rebellion was one of the more fun teams to watch. I actually think it's going to be pretty fun to watch them in best of threes. And I think everyone agrees that the entertainment factor of the teams went way up. Um, so I don't know. Like, I think it's it's going to be a good change. Probably viewership will still be lower for some of the worst best of threes, but probably be higher for some of the better, more hyped up best of threes, one would think. And frankly, like, I don't think that this is instantly going to make North America better, but it's not going to make them worse because adapting is a very crucial skill in League of Legends. And it also is going to encourage them to take more risks because losing one game in a best of three doesn't lose you the entire series, right? And I, I think that lack of fear is going to open up a lot more potential strategies or risk taking from teams. So I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good in the short term. It probably won't do anything, but in the long term, I think it will at least make NA mildly more competitive. D does this mean they're only going to play one best of three a week? So it's almost like a uh, like a foot NFL schedule where you got one game that week and you, you got to put everything into it. Like, what do you think? I mean, yeah, I hope so. It would also it. help for preparation. Um, and it depends, like, are they going to do, um, you know, Super Week still? Hopefully the answer is no, because Super Weeks are ass cheeks. That's my rhyme of the day, D-God. Super Weeks, ass cheeks. Dom, what do you make of uh, super, uh, super Weeks and Best of Threes? I mean, I don't think that they could do it with Super Weeks. Like, it wouldn't really make sense. Um, it would have because... to be a four-day Super Week. 
Yeah, it would have to be a four-day Super Saturday, Week Sunday, in order yeah. to make it work, which um, seems like it wouldn't, yeah, it, it wouldn't uh, do that well. I think that overall, I think it's a positive change. Right now is probably the best time that they could have ever done this because this is one of the most watchable um, leagues we've had. Like, there was a ton of parity in the league. Um, you know, the race for playoffs was really close uh, throughout pretty much the entire season. And then e the bottom teams were just m much more fun to watch than um, than we've seen before in the past. Like Immortals, I thought, was was decent throughout most of the season. Shopify was good. You know, Dignitas w was definitely watchable. So I think it was actually a, I think it's a good change. And I, I like the fact that they are um, doing it because it just makes uh, the matches feel to me like more important because you do only have one best of three versus every single team in the league. Yeah. Again, I mean, I just going back to the example of immortals is rise. It feels like they, they were constantly saying, you know, we're a scrim team, we're a scrim team. And, and they had more to pull out. So giving them opportunities to do that will be interesting. And, and really see how this season shakes up. Everyone said that 100 Thieves was terrible in scrims, but they were a stage team and they would show up and win. Well, you know, they have to do it over and over again. And uh, I think... The how, how did 100 Thieves do when we got to the best of series? I think that's exactly. the other thing, is that yeah. it makes teams a lot less fraudulent uh, in general because you're playing, a, you know, a similar kind of League of Legends to the one you'd be playing in playoffs, right? With adaptation and you know, kind of forced to being go down deeper into your champion pools, less opportunity to kind of cheese people to just a, a win, right? Because they have another couple of chances to come back potentially. I, I will say one of the things that we may miss is kind of the accelerated schedule because they're only going to be able to pre-record drafts of the first game and then they're going to have to do the other uh, two, but you know, one or two games live, right? Um, or maybe they'll just do it all live. I don't know. So we may we may lose the pre-recorded draft and kind of the snappier timing that we had with the schedule. I, I think that's fine. I honestly think that's fine. If you just get through the first one. Think, what do you think about two O's, it? Like it'll it'll be I think that best of threes is all good. I'm trying to figure out what the bad are bad is. Like where where's the negative of this other than the speed of the draft, other than you know, cheese drafts. Not that we got a ton of them. Like no, what, I mean, what uh, is the, bad? The, the, the negative that, that people will complain about is the fact that you only get to watch uh, the top teams play potentially one best of three. I mean, you would only get the top teams playing one best of three the entire time. So if one of the teams wakes up and has a bad day, then that's all you get to see for the whole regular season. Mm. I guess. Yeah, I guess that's it. Right. LCK runs two a double round robin best of threes, but they just have more broadcast days. So, uh, sure. And any any other negative there, Monty, that you can think of? I think that's a good one. Uh, and people people just complained about having to watch the bottom teams play more games, you know, back to back. Also, I will say, just from a scheduling perspective, having an unknown match length is annoying for viewers because it could be two or three games. It's hard to plan your time around that. And the thing that, at least in LCK, you always know when the second match started, starts because even if it's a 2-0, they will literally just sit there for an hour before the next match begins. So you can always plan your day around start time. So the really annoying thing is that what LCS will almost certainly do is run what we call an accelerated schedule, which means that if it's a 2-0, the next match begins immediately after that 2-0. So the second match could have a variable start time. And so you could miss the match you actually want to see. Um, which is annoying for viewers. And the reason they'll run the accelerated schedule almost certainly, I could be wrong, uh, is because it saves money on hourly rates for people. Um, so, you know, there's that factor as well, is that at least you kind of knew when the start time was. Now, obviously, games have variable, variable lengths, but not. it wouldn't be like an hour difference unless there was a mega pause, which, to be fair, happened quite a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, but you, you understand pause. potential scheduling annoyances. Yeah. Again, with the state of LA or the state, the city of LA, the state of California, the longer, if it goes past a certain work length, then they get paid overtime, extra time. And that's just yeah. uh, one of the major cost uh, thoughts that Riot has to go through. And we know that they are thinking about those things. So anyways, those are some of the early reactions, the best of threes, one of the biggest pieces of news coming out of LCS for this split let us know what you think it's, in the comments yeah it's obviously great from a competitive angle guys there's no downside there it's just whether 
casuals will watch best of threes? That's the question. I don't think that's who we're catering to as much. Anymore. Well, yeah, we know what our audience is going to say, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> All right. So that news just came out earlier. Uh, things that happened, I guess, last week and the week before, some major finals just played on out. We got to see uh, a great installation of the same matchup, Gen G versus T1 in the LCK finals. And then another installation of the same matchup in the LEC with Fnatic and G2 right afterwards. And then obviously the LCS had their finals uh, weekend a couple of whiles back. So we're going to have a little bit of high key, no key, high key, low key, no key on the finals production. Which production did you feel like you're going to roll with? Let us know and let's get into it right now. High key, low key, no key. All right, Monty. Give us your no key. Which one is the one that you throw in the dumpster afterwards, given the fact that these production teams are working with <laughs> different budgets and different objectives? All right, here we go. go. Here we go. No key is definitely LEC, who tried the least hard. At least LCS brought in the guy to scream rise into a microphone over and over and over, over again. Uh, LEC decided that they were suddenly Asia and put a bunch of cherry blossom trees. Remember, they are in Germany. They decided that they were in Japan, or kind of vaguely Asia. Laura wore like a, like a Chinese-style dress, and they, they put like paper, pink paper circles that they dropped onto the stage to look like uh, cherry blossoms, and then they put cherry blossoms in the background. But remember, this is not, you know, the LJL or the LCK, where there are a bunch of, you know, actual cherry trees in bloom right now it was in fact in germany where as far as i am aware there are zero cherry trees um so i thought it was just first off a, an extremely fucking weird choice and second off it wasn't hype there was nothing hype about this whatsoever it was so dry uh and you the, the other problem is like Okay, spring finals in LCS. You were at Raleigh, Degon. How many people were in that stadium last year? Uh, the first match, it was not that full. But then the second match, it was almost full. It was almost full. Oh, really? All right, fair yeah, enough. It was almost, it was full. almost yeah. full? That's, that's yes. fair enough. Um, but I mean, like, we just know in L LEC that if this had been in France, it would have been full. It would have been right? full, 100%. So I, I think that for me... The other thing that was so sad about LEC is like LCS wasn't quite getting things full uh, in some of the spring, the recent like spring stadium events, but you just know it would have been full for LEC. So it feels even worse. Dom, yeah. you, did you go to the LEC finals? No, I didn't go to the LEC finals. I, okay. I saw everyone afterwards, but I didn't, I didn't actually go to the finals. <laughs> um, what did you, you make of it? I mean, it was, it's just like sad to me as somebody who's watched LEC. Like, I've watched almost every single match of LEC ever. Like, I, I started watching LEC. Like, I would watch it all the time as a pro player. Um, like, when it was back when it was EU LCS. And when you think about, like, what this match is, I mean, this is G2 versus Fnatic. This is the two. I mean, obviously, now you have Mad and, and K Corp, which are like their big fan bases, but they're not really League of Legends fan bases. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah. I guess they're technically the biggest fan bases, but it feels like those those people just like don't care. They just want to like insult you because you're not Spanish or you're not French or whatever. Um, but but like G2 Fnatic, that is like the ideal final. That is the the final that you're looking forward to um, if you're a, a fan of LEC and to see that the level of the final is just like from production standpoint is so mediocre i mean it wasn't even full like i saw empty seats so i don't know if it was like sold out but people didn't go but there's empty seats in like a 200 person theater um it was rough and you could tell by the quality of the games like you could tell the players didn't feel super pressured like i mean hans is literally chasing a pentakill over ending the game they can end the game 100 and they're flashing for a pentakill <laughs> instead it just feels like in like every other match so I mean, this is what Riot <laughs> wants to do. They want to downsize things in the, the West. They don't want to do as many stadiums. Um, and yeah, I mean, this is the trade-off. Everyone seemed to... I, I think what's crazy is the the change in uh, perspective from fans. Because when originally the LEC format started with the 9 BO1s into best of threes into best of five, 
uh, format last year, everyone was like, this format is insane and all we lose is one stadium event. But after watching this format for like a year and a half now, it seems like people don't really enjoy the format anymore. They'd rather it just be straight up best of threes um, and, you know, just have a, a stadium event uh, twice a year instead of just once a year. So I haven't really enjoyed like the way that LEC has done things. I mean, obviously they cut a bunch of people. So I, I feel bad for the people that are working on LEC right now because it feels like they just don't have anything to work with, really. Like they're just trying to make the best out of what they can. But obviously they don't have the same budget. They're not producing a ton of content the way that they were before. Um, it just seems like it's a very like bare bones crew that's running everything. Yeah, this feels like the first year of a transition for the LEC. I think I went on Reddit and saw, you know, one of those posts saying basically what you said. It feels bare bones. Shox was in there and saying like, hey, we're doing the best that we can. And then obviously everyone, you know, uh, reverse faces when Shox addresses you. But uh, it it maybe the payoff for the summer championship will offset it and people will forget this. And you just have to kind of deal with a a spring split that's going to be lesser because you're right guys it, it did feel a little clunky the way that the lec final kind of played out so uh i think that's also my no key for a lot of the same reasons that you guys brought up um yeah i still think the lec format is very good by the way like i don't have any issues with it but i think it's important to remember that it really is the wrapping around a sport that makes it hype and makes it compelling. And it is very easy to look at a spreadsheet of line items and costs and start cutting these things. But the result of doing this and the result of killing the hype and the excitement around your esport is that fans are just going to stop watching, right? The way you engage people to watch the earlier stages of the event is that they have hype of it building into something. If it just stays at the same low note the entire time, then you actually just kill people's enthusiasm for your region or for your yep. sport in general, right? I mean, and I, I think it's it, it's really easy for some guy named John Needham in a suit who doesn't know shit about esports or sports to be like, this is an easy budget cut to make, but you don't realize like the effects around sentiment that this has with the community. Yeah, I'd say the one thing about the format is it makes people not really care about championships anymore. Like no one actually I, I've talked to people, right? No one considers Yike a five time champion, even though technically he's won five of these splits because they're like these mini splits and there's just so much so many more opportunities. When you compare somebody like Yike to, you know, uh, somebody who played a bunch of years like so as it's hard to be like, oh, yeah, Yike has a comparable amount of titles like Yike has has more titles now. You go, Yike and Yike. I, I think that's. I think that's the perception, Dom, because there's a lack of ramp into something exciting. Like, for example, when I was casting, when OGN had three tournaments a year, nobody considered, the, you know, none of them champions. The thing is, they felt like champions because there was a fucking epic final. We were on the beach in Busan or we were in the stadium in Seoul, right? And so it felt like a championship moment. And it's that feeling that gives it. I don't think it's because of the format. And I don't think it's because there are three splits instead of two. Because I was casting three splits in instead of two for two years. And it didn't feel bad. The thing is, it feels bad because there's no actual momentum into a big moment. Well, also, I think the OGN season was just longer because if I remember correctly, the OGN winter season was actually like in winter. Like it would start in December, right? Yeah, but it would end in like February. Each of them was about three months and then they had some downtime. So yeah, exactly. And they, so it's like three month tournaments instead of like these six week long tournaments. Like like the amount of time it was takes two for months. one split. I mean, I, I think it wasn't winter shorter or something, but I remember just like watching it and it felt like a legitimate split where like oh. these splits, like if they go by so quick. Yeah, you lose, like, you're basic, out in three basically weeks. You, basically you had, um, so you would play six games in the group stage. Um, you'd have to play six games because you'd be in, um, you'd be playing best of twos a lot of time and you'd be playing in a group of four teams. So you'd play six games and then you'd go into best of fives and playoffs and it was single elimination. So you could re remember that SK Telecom, when they had their perfect season in winter 2013 to 2014, after they won worlds, they only played 15 games in that whole season because they won every game. Yep. But the maximum amount of game you could play is 21. So it, it actually wasn't very long. Hmm. 
Well, uh, hopefully there are learnings to take away from this one. And, you know, again, where where does this fall, right? Is it on, like, LEC being like, hey, we, we thought we could get away with it at this level? Because obviously it's not on the casters. It's not on the talent team. It's not the people that you saw up front on the camera. They knew and they did their best. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I love my peers for doing that. And we're not putting that on them at all. But is it... LEC? Is it LOL Esports? Is it Global? Is it it's Riot not, in it's general? It's not LEC. I mean, LEC is given a budget, right? Yeah. And th this is what... I mean, it probably is on LEC a little bit because they chose to do this format rather than spend the money on a, like a roadshow, right? Um, but, but you know, it's, it's the cost cutting that's happening because it's also LCS that wasn't at a stadium for spring. And yep. they've just seen that this is the, the you know, uh, this they perceive that, like, here's how it goes, guys. The perception is, well, we get X amount of viewership when we're just in the studio. So, okay, our viewership de maybe decreases a little bit. But so let's just cut out the finals and do it there because it's not, you know, it's not a necessary expense. What they don't realize is that on a long enough timeline, the lack of hype from not having these big finals is going to kill the regular season viewership from the studio. All right, so that was the no key. Let's go to, uh, yeah, I'm just kidding. We're, we're back. You know, I was trying to pretend like nothing <laughs> happened. We didn't get, uh, you know, meriled, but uh, it happens. All right, uh, let's, uh, so we talked about LEC, all the drawbacks of, you know, the, the decisions they've made recently. I guess our low key then goes to what here, Dom? And why? Uh, I mean, I'm going double, double no key. I'll go no key again for <laughs> LCS because like, I just think all these studio finals are just so bad. And to be honest, like I kind of have a different opinion than Monty where Monty like was saying, at least they tried with the, um, like the guy yelling rise into a microphone for me that's a negative like i think the musical performances we just need to stop musical performances in esports like there's just no point to them like a bunch of the people that are going like you have a bunch of people that go and they're all just like people that are going to watch video games they're not people that are going to watch a musical performance so the person is always like like screaming their heart out they're like lose yourself then rise and like he just like puts his hand out and then everyone else is just sitting there like this just waiting for this shit to be over. <laughs> Everyone just sits there the entire time like that. And like, it, for me, just watching it, it's just so uncomfortable, man. I just feel like I'm, like I'm watching, uh, like, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm just, just, just watching like a guy just lose his soul. Like it's gotta be fucking embarrassing as fuck for the, the people that are performing. Like they get off stage like, shit, like I, did I do bad? Or like, I mean, at least we got fucking paid. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Like it, it's, it's tough. And we're going to lead into this, but I think that that's one of the good things about LCK. Like LCK, I think did it perfectly. It was all about the players, all about the hype of the match, all about the importance and the history of this like rivalry. That's what's supposed to get you hyped for the match. Not some dude like singing a fucking song. Like the song just never helps me, bro. I, I just don't <laughs> like the songs. <laughs> no, I agree with your take, Dom. I just think it, 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 they tried harder than LEC did. Sometimes like, you try harder and, and it ends up worse, bro. I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's funny because, L, you know, I don't understand LCS's budgets, by the way. So no offense to Degon here, but they took Degon and Jat out and did a, a, a day of shooting on a golf course with like a million drone shots and like spent a bunch of cash on that on a video that has less than a quarter of the views that this show gets. So w w what are they spending money on? It was a great day. <laughs> I'm sure it was, Degon. I'm sure it was a lot of fun. They did a good job with the video, but like, why? <laughs> it also led as, uh, you know, teaser content that they could use on the finals on pre-show day uh, for day three. It was, it was <laughs> multiple a, use. That's not a bad it point. Use, right? That's not a bad point. That's a good point. That a lot a of point. a lot of bad content creators or producers will make their thing in a way that they cannot cut down for multiple usage. It was multiple usage. So mm -hmm. I don't know. But, you know, there there's different budgets and buckets. Don't take away from my golf fund, Monty. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, Degon. If I say it, Riot will do the exact opposite. So they probably have an entire season of golf content for you. So enjoy. Nice. Thanks. Uh, but my, my point is, is like, this yeah. is this is what they do with their money. Why? Uh, and again, like everything about this was weak. Again, they put it on Easter, despite the fact that they said they weren't going to put it on Easter. 
or they said they technically didn't say they weren't going to do it. They said that last year it was a, a, it was un it was suboptimal. I believe suboptimal. was the word that jo that John Needham used. It was suboptimal because they ran out of days because of scheduling conflicts, and so this was the day that the stadium was available on. Now, yeah. why it had to be in their studio on Easter when they own it and could have done it any fucking time they wanted to, that is a, the true mystery. Yeah, well, I heard Mark Z say that Easter only affected it by a whopping 2%, so <laughs> maybe they just keep on having it in the in the studio. You know what's crazy, guys, is Easter moves every year, and they still manage to do it twice. Yep. <laughs> I mean, the finals is on a Sunday, so I guess that limits it somewhat. They're like, we have to do it on the final Sunday. So kind of running into Easter. Like, I guess it's like it becomes like a one in four, one in five chance. Yeah. Uh, the I will say the fan meet and the, all the teams showed up. They had players out there. I saw um, Insanity and Turtle, all of 100 Thieves was there with their roster and the coaches and um, general manager. So I think uh, Cloud9 was the only team that did send anyone uh, there, <laughs> plus the two teams that were obviously playing. That was, you know, and that, that makes sense. They had just lost the day before. But having the Fan Fest outside, building extra seating, that was pretty full. I, I will say the semi, uh, the, the, I got lower bracket finals. I'm not sure if you guys remember seeing another broadcast. It was not full inside. It was, it was a little weird because uh, you know we had so many other days where uh, the stadium was full, and I think it was one of those things where people had tickets, but it was Saturday, and they weren't sure if they're going to go or not, or their comp tickets, and there was just they would do like these the the, the crane shots that look good or just essential to a broadcast. And as it panned over, there were there were just big blocks missing. And it, it did detract from, again, the feeling of a finals. You want to feel the stadium. You want to feel the stage. I say, I'd say on Sunday, they did a much better job of setting that up, having, you know, the fan fest outside and showing all of that. I think the players felt it there. But I think on Saturday, it was just more of like a shellacking of, of Cloud9 by, by, by TL. And that was, that was basically it. Um, but the, the effort there to reach the fans, I think did a decent job for the fans that were there on Sunday. So I'd give it low key. That's my point. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think for me, it's just super hard to go from like stadiums all the time to like, just like no stadiums. I don't know. It, it's just, it, it kills the hype. It's like, it just feels like we're going in reverse. Well, you know, the thing is you just don't even have to have a stadium event, right? You could just have oh, yeah. a one to 2000 person theater 100%. event and it would be totally fine. Yeah. I mean, theaters can look big and you feel the hype if you play in the theater. I mean, I played in, in, in some of, uh, you know, events that were super hyped that were like sub 5,000 people, um, you know, during my career. Cause in season two, you know, we, we went through to a bunch of MLGs and like IPLs and casinos essentially. Oh, yeah. And that I, was... I was there too. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought that there was, there was tons of hype there. So yeah. I just think that that LCS and LEC, it just feels, it feels bad. And I think that one thing that they need to start doing, if they're going to do this, they have to just move these finals off the days of LCK and LPL because LCK and LPL, like oh, we're going to have LPL finals this weekend. There's just so much hype in those events. And then you go from like these LCK LPL events that are super, super hype to watching like the studio finals where it's like, you have like fake fucking blossoms fall onto like the tables. And then you see like the players, like, wiping them off the desk before they like set up their mouse they're like all right let me just move this here oh jesus it's all over the place it's like in their keyboard it's like i mean it's just such a fucking mess man please it, it, it's also just funny to have the confetti out before the games start because you're you're used to seeing it at, you know when somebody wins and so it's just like all over the stage already you're like did somebody already win what the fuck is happening yeah i don't know it's tough man it, it's really tough yeah, I went to just triple check, right? Because one, uh, now that we've done the two other uh, major region finals, the the only other t league this season that is going to do an in-person stadium final is Brazil, right? I think that was the only other one that did. Every other league did a, and I guess e EMEA Masters, or is that over at uh, the LEC studio? Because every other league did an online final. We've seen Turkey at... Uh, Fenerbahce 07, like basketball stadium that was packed and it was crazy. They didn't do that this year. Obviously, 
VCS with everything that they did. I don't even know if it was planned to or not. They didn't have a uh, a uh, stadium final either. So it, it looks like it was a pullback across the whole ecosystem, except for uh, uh, LPL and LCK and Brazil for some reason. They, like Brazil knew. They knew. Um, so it's it's Brazil not just, just one audience. Case. Like I don't know. Like they they have Cibo Lao, which is put on by Bayano, and you know that gets two hundred twenty thousand views. They just have passion in that region, which there just isn't that much of in in LCS. I mean, I think the LEC one is the most confusing because LEC there's definitely regional passion, and if you you can yeah. move like like Madi said, you can put it in Spain or France, and you're guaranteed to have like a, a full stadium. Like French fans will go to, to to anything, you know, and we've had events in those stadiums before um but yeah i i feel like right now it just it's so hard to go from lpl lck into lec lcs so at least move it on like a different day so it doesn't feel as bad when the finals was in miami that was 100 thieves on nine yeah 100 thieves tail um one what were the drawbacks? I, I can't remember because that that finals I really don't remember too much about. Was it was were there drawbacks about it? Because I think you're right. I think if it's done right, it, it is. It was a three zero. That was the drawback. <laughs> like the product. That's what kind of killed the fucking <laughs> hype. Yeah. All right. Well, either way, a no key for Dom, a low key for Monty and I. Low key for me. Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's start glazing LCK finals. Let's just get to it, man. It was so great. I was, was there. So <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> was it they let you in? It was fucking awesome in person. It was fucking awesome. Was... I've I've actually cast in that arena previously. Um, so I've I've been there, I think, a couple times now. So Worlds 2014 semifinals were there, and then 2016 summer was there, I believe. Um, so I've been in that venue previously and it's a great venue so it's part of the olympic com uh complex from that was built in 1998 for the seoul olympics and it was the old gymnastic stadium it has like 15,000 capacity and it was fucking jammed um it it looked amazing on stream it looked equally amazing in person all the stuff they did with the flags was super cool in fact it was actually even cooler in person because i went back and like looked at um how it came across on camera and you guys could see all the people like holding the the like lights some some details were actually lost on stream so for example when they did the t1 introduction it was like it was all red except they had the t1 logo made out of some of the lights like around the arena oh, that's so cool. there was yeah, white so you, like when you looked out it was like red except for the t1 logo like drawn in the lights in the crowd and same thing with gen g it was like yellow with the white gen g logo um and it was hard to see that on stream but it was really awesome in person um, it was deafening, like it was so fucking loud in there. And they basically had uh, split the stadium into the two different fan bases. So the T1 half was on the like T1 had their backs to the T1 half and Genji had their backs to the Genji half. Um, it was just epic, man. And like it, I, I, this is the reason why I always loved Korean esports and I wanted to go cast in Korea is because the vibe there is just unrivaled compared to any other place in the world the passion um you know the the legitimate fandom um you know the the desire to view, witness excellence and like the celebration of excellence so carmine corp fans like think about that for a second um you know th <laughs> people care about you know you get fans by being the best that's how you get fans in Korea. And Gen G has well, apparently only not if you're Chobi. Apparently, if you're Chobi, you just get like flamed <laughs> for years, even though you're like the best Korean player for years as well. Like, well, I think the Korean fans really love Chobi. Um, really? But like, did yeah, Gen the, G. The, Gen... Did you hear the applaud? Maybe it sounded different on stream, but when they announced Chobi compared to when they announced all the T1 players, it was like, <laughs> like he is less popular than the least popular T1 player. 
no, 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 no. It, it really was. The Gen G audience was very loud in person. It probably had really? something to do with where the crowd mics were. Yeah, maybe um, they were so, like, hey, all right. So T1 asked us to, to uh, put the mics closer. Yeah, it sounded like, I agree. It sounded like T1's fans were louder than Gen G's fans it on literally, stream. Like, I think, when they announced like people like Keen, it literally sounded silent, actually. No, 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 no. no. It was actually crazy in there. Trust me. It was it was okay, pretty good. even if you were actually in the arena. Uh, there were I was actually surprised by how loud the Gen G fans were. And they, I was sitting on the T1 side of the arena and they were really loud and like they were like uh, completely across the arena from me. So yeah, it, I would say that that was probably just a sound issue. It was, it did not sound like that in person. So it was okay, great. Good. Like, you know, it was epic. I think to what, to Dom's point, they, they're still running the OGN production playbook, which is like no live bands, 100% focus on the players. Yes. Uh, it feels yes. like a real sport in that way. And they've always done it this way in Korea because the thing is, guys, the way esports was designed in Korea was it was designed by third party tournament operators that w had no shot at making money from selling you the game. It comes from StarCraft. Did they make money when additional copies of StarCraft were sold? No. Do they make money when skins are sold in League of Legends? Well, they do now because it's Riot, but no was the answer for OGN. Uh, and so, and Spo TV as well when they when they entered the mix. And so the only thing they care about is getting the largest possible audience and creating a sports product that you want to watch more of. And the way they do that is like in regular sports is like by fucking selling you the actual players. That's the product. Yep. The product is the production. The product is making you fans of teams and players. And it comes through, right? You know, Riot. They want to sell you fucking KDA skins at Worlds. So instead of, you know, I thought that the 10 year anniversary of Worlds was fucking pathetic because they spent hardly any time on the history of the game or the history of Worlds or the history of the players. And it's like, here's some augmented reality Ari shaking her fucking ass at you by KDA skins. And I, I don't boomer. care about it. There's a boomer take. Boomer take. I'm just kidding. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah, I like things I can actually fuck be gone. Yep. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> All right. Nice. <laughs> nice. Cook it. <laughs> uh, the 10 year presentation of the LCK was pretty amazing getting all the, uh, the that was when they got all the pros they put their names on the on like the screen and then they like slowly revealed all these epic players from lck slash champions right is that the 10 year uh celebration that lck did oh Monty? no the, the 10 year celebration of lck was fucking amazing the 10 year yeah. anniversary of worlds was what i was talking about yes right that right, was right. They, they, the, they, the 10 year too. lck where they trotted they brought all the, you know a bunch of the famous old players back and had them in person on stage was fantastic so isn't that LCS did something similar, right? You know, it was 10 year LCS and then yeah. they brought out the top 10 players. And I think they had, yeah, yeah, that was good. You're and double lift, bring the trophy out together. Is that what it was or something like that? Yeah. Okay. yeah um, yeah. but, but like the world's one was in China and it was really lame. But uh, this is something that Korean esports has always been. And Riot hired a bunch of the OGN producers after they took over League of Legends and it shows, right? I, I don't think it's quite as good as when it was OGN, but it's still good. And it being there was wonderful and it really got you hyped up. And then we got an epic series on top of that. But I imagine, I imagine Dom's, you know, viewing whiplash. Cause like, obviously I was at the event and then I went home and I went to sleep and this motherfucker had to sit there and like, go into you know, well, yeah. you went into first off a, a fucking banger LPL match. And then you had to watch LEC yeah. and like, you know, it's like kind of just like, I mean, it was, yeah, it was like, it was like LCK is like the finals, right? So like LPL is only yeah. the semifinals. So you go for, for the finals of LCK. Not only was it like a match that delivered, but the production was, I, I thought that was like, probably like, that is ideal for me. Like if you wanted to, oh, to be like, great. okay, what are, what are you looking for, for production? When, when people are like, oh, you don't like the musical performance? Like Dom, you don't like Jax Anderson, like fucking licking the mic and doing like weird, like tongue shit in your eyeballs. Like this, the, it was coming. To be like, if you don't like that, what do you like? It's like, this is what I like. Like this, this LCK finals, like I'm not even really an LCK fan, but I thought that this production was like pretty much perfect. Like this is ideal for what I care about because I think that, that the most interesting part, like the reason why I show up to watch the matches is because I want to watch the fucking teams play. 
I want to watch the teams play. I want to watch the players play against each other. I want to watch T1 lose their fourth final in a row. Like we all will come for the same reasons, right? And I think that, that this just showed you like what it could be if you don't focus so much. Like if you go to LEC, they didn't even talk about the players. Like it wasn't like they were telling the story of like G2 and Fnatic and you know, like Humanoid versus Caps, you know, like they, they didn't tell any stories. It was just like, yep, here's the finals. Here's some blossoms. Like, all right, we're fucking into the games. There was no storytelling at all. So just like the, the LCK finals, I mean, obviously Caster Jun is like a legend. So when he's doing the intros, like the player intros, it just fucking hits different. Um, but yeah, they don't need to just have a musical performance. I, I don't even think the Korean fans want a musical performance. I feel like the Korean fans show up and they're like, let's watch the fucking matches. Like, that's what we came here for. Stop wasting our time and play the fucking matches. Do like a hype intro. Make me realize the importance of the matches and then let me watch the matches. Perfect. That's what I like. Yeah. Uh, chat, you good? <laughs> Jack Sanderson's yeah. voice going to take that one right in the right in the chin, right in the eye. In Jack Sanderson, man. That was like probably the most embarrassing time I ever had as like a fan of like the LCS. It was like, God yeah. damn, bro. Like, I don't want to show anyone yeah. like, what I'm watching. No, it was, it was because like, it was because it was the... it's like, this is what I'm into, bro. Come watch this with me. And then you just have fucking Jack I mean, Sanderson doing that shit. It is. I had to cast shit. the, I had to cast the Overwatch League finals and I got, thrown to out of dj Khaled and had to somehow make that transition after literally standing in the stadium that where dj Khaled was just like tripping his way across the stage Dude, and he was shouting at, he was not <laughs> he was trying <laughs> he, it's the meme of esports if a normie searches esports meme like esports performance meme it's probably dj Khaled. is there a so, better Concert esports meme than DJ Khaled, you know, it whatever was, the fuck he was shuffling. It was so fucking bad. To Dom's point about nobody caring, Dom, there was nothing like being in the Barclays Center in Brooklyn where the Nets play, have it be full to the rafters, and then have DJ Khaled say, put your hands up if you love God, and everyone just sit there and stare at him. It was brilliant. <laughs> and then I had to watch this performance, Dom, and then immediately after that, Doe and I had to fucking cast this match. And I was like, this is so f Doe and I were just sitting there watching this and being like, this is so fucking terrible. There it is. We the best. What was do you remember? Do you remember your take from the toss? <laughs> I don't. I guess just, we can look it up, I guess. Yeah. I, I you know, like obviously we couldn't like shit talk it, but we were just like, okay, that happened. And now let's actually watch some games. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think Jesus. When that stuff's you know happening, what, everyone. You know what was so you know what was so sad about that whole thing was what? that they got Questlove to DJ between games, and it was fucking awesome. Questlove and it, you couldn't great. hear it on stream. You couldn't hear it on stream, but he was like getting the crowd jazzed in between games and in downtime, and it was really cool. And I'm just like, fuck, man, we could have had this. <laughs> Questlove's a real one. He gets his audience. He cares. Yeah, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, whenever there's those like train wrecks that are happening and you're waiting for the toss to come back, those are the ones where I like overthink. What am I gonna do? How do we get out of this? Do we acknowledge it? Do we just move on? That's why I was asking that moment there. Um, you you know what else is sad, Digon, is that what we could have had was actually run the jewels for that owl finals, and instead we got DJ Khaled. That's the, the real jewels. tragedy, because that could have been fucking cool. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Killer Mike's the real one. Also, like they they've been collaborating with video games before. They've, obviously, I listen to yep. they're they're in my uh, my Spotify playlist for their their song in uh, Cyberpunk. And then yep. they had what is it, Lethal Company? They they do the theme music, but then that song actually has lyrics to it. It's 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 they're great. They're great. So, uh, yeah, we're getting attacked now because we we. We uh, have spoken up on both DJ Khaled and uh, Rito. <laughs> uh, all right. So those were the finals. Let us know your thoughts on all three of those major region finals. LPL will be playing later this week, and you can uh, throw in the comments there uh, what you think of the productions, what they could do better, the things that you love about it in the comments below. Uh, speaking of comments, uh, as as I always try to do and forget, but now being better about it, let's take a look at some of the comments from last week's uh, show. A lot of you guys supporting me 
and my rant about fans being soft. Golly, that led into a whole like fan thing. Did you see that? There was one fan that went to Reddit to try to create like, a hate thread on me and it got <laughs> downvoted to hell. I didn't even know it Nobody happened. Nobody can Someone hate you, again. I know. Well, this guy like really did. He's like, ship him to EU. He's an EU lover since he hates NA so much. And that was just the crazy shit. So I, I like messaged him on Reddit. He's like, hey man, want to talk? Screenshotted it, retweeted it. And then he's like, I didn't ever get a message. You're lying about that too. You're just a big liar. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, man. I love, like, I love guy was this, this guy was from South Carolina. I can it tell. Was, it was nuts. You know, uh, I'm Kokona Degon, man. Like, your boy is sticking his head in there in LCS every week. Uh, week in, week out. Unlike some of the other people that like to just claim NA and in the media room. And so it was just the wildest shit I had heard in a while. I, I went down the rabbit hole. The Twitter's there. He like responded to me on Twitter and I just kept going. He kept straw manning me and I was like, here are the facts. Hey, remember this clip at Worlds where I'm the sitting in the front row filming like the, the thing that do you remember me wearing the Kakona hat doing that on this exact show? It was on this show. <laughs> Anyways, uh, you're I'm I, I'm very uh impressed with both of you how you guys deal with the hate the haters because i have my one hater and i i went fist to fist if i had like 100 haters you know no you just I got gotta hands. block them. i don't know if i got enough hands you just, you just gotta just gotta block them and move on yeah. uh a couple other things that came up were um spot on monty double lift isn't a liar deceptive the hamster on the wheel in his head just can't keep up uh that was what we we're talking about you guys i ran a take do you guys still have the same take on that, by the way? I, yeah, I, I ran. I ran a poll on my Twitter asking, "Is Double Lift an idiot, a liar, or both?" And I want you guys to know that after eleven thousand votes, both won, but at a sixty-five percent ratio. So you guys think he's both? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would say this because, like, I think that you know, one one person that's great at dealing with this type of stuff is Thorin. And I think that Thorin actually proves that Double Lift is in fact lying. Yeah, it's true. Because, it was a good video. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a great video, but I think that, that so I would I would put this to you, Deegan, like, how is Double Lift not a liar when he literally described what a lane swap was, then he described what a Scion dive strat was, he described the differences between both, and then he claimed that they were the same later on to make Monty look bad. Like, isn't that just by definition lying? Like, I think that he is just a piece of shit. I think Double Lift is a piece of fucking shit. I think, I think he's I think he's mind controlled by a piece of shit. Let me put it that way. I don't think so. I think that that's like cop out. I think that that it's like, oh, like I don't think that's Lena like out. sat down and was like, hey, make this video. I think that this was his genuine reaction. And I think that he is just a lying piece of shit. I, I think it's just the the brain dissonance. He's decided that Monty's wrong, but he also can't be wrong himself. So he had to prove that he knew what it was. I don't think that's malicious. <laughs> I think it's dumb. I think it's dumb. I think it's dumb. Well, I think I think but he's lying. You know, like he he is when, he is lying objectively. Like he knows what a lane swap is. Like this guy. Like I, I don't know why the community thought that this guy who has played literally thousands of lane swaps. Like like you ever see the video of me getting my blue stolen by Aframu? I'm playing versus double lift in a lane swap on LCS stage during that video. Like <laughs> this guy. Like people actually think that he's so dumb that he's like laning bot lane. And he's like. Are there two people in my lane or is there one? Is this a is this an eighty carry or a top laner that I'm laning against? I don't fucking know. Like, do they actually think that this guy is this fucking stupid? Like, come, on, I think there's limits to his stupidity. Like, I don't think that he's that stupid. Like, I think he's actually like decently like knowledgeable about the game. I would say. Yeah. Well, then yeah, he's just I, a liar. Just, like, he's just he's just objectively a liar, right? Dom, I also just like the random slander he was throwing around, like calling you a parasite. I don't understand what makes you more of a parasite than him, by the way, because as far as I, I can mean, tell, I, you guys I, basically do the same shit. We do the same thing, but I create way more content outside of actually just like streaming and reacting than he does. Like I, I create content like this show right here. I do like <laughs> breakdowns before worlds, after worlds. Yep. I've done like cut yep. the Western shit before. Like if you want to talk about like who's creating more content outside of things, that's actually adding things instead of just like, if you're considering me a parasite because I'm taking from the scene in his eyes by co-streaming, which is like, dude, you'd literally do the same thing as me. But like, let's, let's forget about the like, the fact that he's just a massive hypocrite like I, I don't actually see how he could say i'm more of a parasite than him in, in this in this um situation but i think that he's just like throwing insults like he's just insulting me personally i don't think that he actually thinks i'm so a parasite ridiculous. it just sounds like good right it's like oh that guy is a parasite like 
<laughs> well, He's it's also just it, <laughs> it's it, it it's also just a logical fallacy because he just discredits you by calling you a parasite, but he doesn't actually address any of your your points. Well, because right? so he just because he, I'm just objectively yeah, of course. Like, <laughs> like I said, this is this is something that Thor like Thorne is really good at pointing this this out. The reason why he's a liar is not because of the fact that like that it's like I don't know like maybe he could know what, like no he proves in the video he knows what a lane swap is. He he says what a lane swap is and the reasons for a lane swap. He literally says in the video verbatim or I mean I guess I shouldn't say verbatim cuz I'm going to para I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase here. Paraphrase. He essentially says he, he actually he, he essentially says that the reason why you lane swap here is because Jinx and Lulu don't want to lane versus the Varus Ash in lane until they get Berserker's Greaves and then at Berserker's Greaves the lane becomes stable and you can lane against them. So he actually like proved that he knew what a lane swap was. And then he just took something which he knew wasn't a lane swap and then said it was a lane swap to make Monty look like a fucking idiot, right? Like that was the point of what he did. So he is a malicious lying piece of shit objectively. Like there's there's no there's no wiggle room <laughs> Thank like you, Dom. <laughs> I think the problem is that, you know, unfortunately, like, you know, you can disagree with me, but the way to disagree with me is basically to conclude that BDS is extremely stupid and just got lucky. And you kind of have to say that in a way, um, because there's no other reason to describe why they were doing what they were doing. And then that just opens you up to attacks from the French fans. So a lot of people just like, especially Cajal just didn't even want to engage in that. Because if you start doing analysis about what BDS actually did, you have to conclude that they got insanely lucky. And the thing that they did was kind of dumb. Malicious is such a strong word. I just, you know, <laughs> I mean, it, it is. I mean, the, the, it, 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 there are other things he lied about, D Yes, I know. So I know, he, I know, he I like know. he like pretended that I hadn't been making League of Legends content when he knew that I had yes. been because of the TSM Holy War, where he and Lena got caught in a conflict of interest that was entirely discussed on some I mean, insight the, because to make you look irrelevant. <laughs> like that's the point. Is like he's trying to make you look. Real. He's like, I didn't even know that this guy was doing it. Oh, really? Like, like it's like, okay, man. All right, bro. Like that's like me being like, oh, I didn't even know Double was a pro player last year. I thought he's been co-streaming the whole time. Like, what the fuck is this, man? Like, what are we actually dealing with? Like, yeah, like, it's how so, dumb is, so, is the community like, that when I put out it, that video showing that he was lying, like they needed. They need Thorin to go back and be like, guys, the reason why it's a lie is because he he explains what what a lane swap is. He explains it himself what a lane swap is. So you can't say that he's just ignorant or, oh, it's just it's just stupidity. Never attribute to malice what you could to stupidity. Like you can't literally do that. The only way you can do that is if he doesn't explain to you what a fucking lane swap is right beforehand. That's the only way, man. Like it's it's so tough to deal with because I feel like everyone just wants to like i mean he was a, he was a good player so everyone was wants to like side with him they don't want to realize that like that he's a good player and a piece of shit i mean we see it like all the fucking time it's like man i wish that double lift wasn't a piece of shit man i like the way he plays that's how everyone feels it's like well too bad man like i don't know he's just like it just is what it is damn did i just get summed up i think it's more because i the more people i've met and talked to they're like you know i'm like hey who's who's like the greatest teammate you play with or like someone you wish you'd play with, whether they played with them or not, Peter's almost always in that conversation. And I think that's why it's, it's disappointing. So, all right. Uh, one more comment was, so we had my rant to get random person. Also like, uh, you know, I, what, I, what pisses me off is like the reason he's mad at me because I didn't have a bad relationship previously was yeah. because I pointed out that his relationship was a conflict of interest and he should not, in fact, you know, Lena should not be running the League of Legends team at TSM while he is a fucking player on that team. It, it's a professional complaint that any fucking functional adult would be like, you know what? Uh, we probably shouldn't be doing this stuff together. And then they are so stupid that they get caught red-handed doing exactly the thing that they shouldn't be done. And now he's mad at me because I talked about the thing that they broadcast doing the thing that they shouldn't be doing. Well, it wasn't their fault. It was Lenovo PC's fault. So let's, uh, <laughs> let's just make sure that everyone is aware that Lenovo PCs are just piece of shit PCs. Like the Arso, like the sponsor of TSO, which is horrible. And that's the reason why this came about. So, 
So anyway, that that is why he's mad at me for things that he did. I don't understand. Yeah, wait, wait till the Valorant stuff starts coming out. That shit is rampant, rampant. I know one of the top teams in like a major region that has that set up, and it's disgusting. And it's affected the team. It's it's the conflict. Of like it does. The conflict of interest was is conflicting the team. It's made this team significantly worse. Um, last little bit here was uh, where to go? Uh, oh, okay. It was the whole lane swap breakdown was Monty being in his element, Dom having uh, flashbacks from playing it so many years and me just snacking. Everyone very much loved our uh, lane swap breakdown. So uh, we, we should do a couple more of those things, educating the youngins about things. We can. Sure. Uh, all right. So cheers. Thanks, everyone, for your comments. We appreciate you guys uh, being active in there. And I just want to give a shout out to a couple of people that did that. Um, and again, just like we wouldn't be able to have this show without you guys participating, being part of it, we also wouldn't be able to have our show without some of our friends. And we're talking about AG1. Even when I'm on the road, boom, bring my AG1 with me. Uh, again, since we've had the opportunity to put AG1 as part of our routine. It's made it so easy for me to put all my uh, all my nutrients in a one daily drink. Obviously, on the road, on the go, wherever you need to go. Me not even being home, I can bring the packets with me. And so that's yep. what I did. It's been great. I'm, I've am i always said it. Say it again. It's helped me with my gut health. I've been going consistently. It hasn't. It's It's been great, you know. I've been having uh, variable food choices when I'm in uh, Vegas, but it does not matter because of my friends over at AG1, Monty. Yeah, no, it's great. Look, uh, great for creatine, is, as uh, Digan and I have said previously in the morning. Great just to, I mean, I, I just feel more energetic when I kind of take it on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of evens out my energy a little bit. So it's been great. Like, really enjoy this stuff. And as Degon says, you can get it in the travel packets as well. So it's super easy just to take one at a time with you wherever you're going. I did the same thing, Degon, when I, I, I've been gone for the last two days at Legoland for my kid's birthday here <laughs> yeah, in Korea. Right. It's been it was really fun. Legoland AG in it up. Uh, yep. I just shared some with some uh, some friends out here and they said, as Dom likes to point out, the taste was so surprising. It looks like a green juice. Doesn't taste like a green juice. It tastes like a like a fruit drink. It's yeah, a, a lot of the time you get green juices, you think it's kale. You don't like the taste. Not the case here with uh, pineapple core and some of its other ingredients gives you the nutrients you need to be at your best. So thanks to our friends over at AG1. We've gotten a lot of feedback as well from fans. And I would say a fellow caster has asked me, hey, can you hook me up? And we've been able to do that. So make sure to get yours over uh, at uh, at their website. And so uh, where's our, here it is, okay. Uh, if you want to try AG1, get AG1 and a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2 and five free AG1 travel packs, which are the ones that Monty and I use with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash LFN legends. That's drinkag1.com slash LFN legends. Check it out. Support the show and support your health. Thanks to our friends over at AG1. All right. Goodness gracious, we got through that. Yes, chat. I was holding my breath while they were just fighting with, you know, one of the greatest players of all time. Rightfully so. But, you know me, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I'm not a huge conflict guy unless I feel fervent about it, but I support my boys. <laughs> uh next up let's get to uh keep or kick yeah, we neither. had a couple of <laughs> yeah me neither me neither you don't like conflict yeah i don't like conflict it makes me feel uncomfortable <laughs> try to avoid it at all costs <laughs> yeah, let's get to keep or kick all right so keep or kick there was some conflict in a couple of roles here and we're going to decide which change are we keeping and which change are we kicking and yes, I'm talking about Thanatos and Fudge or Closer and Bow. Which one is the one that we're keeping or kicking? Let's get into it. All right. High profile changes. Uh, 
you know, we've been high on Bo for a while, hasn't quite popped off. Fudge has seen a sharp, or I guess not a sharp, but a consistent decline since his It's been peak. a slow decline over years. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So the changes have been made. The closer one, I think, is alleged. The Thanatos one has gone through uh, and, and has been announced. So which one do... What, what, how, how do we want to rate this one? Do, which one do we feel like is going to be more impactful? Which one are we keeping? <laughs> which, which one are we impact? keeping on each of these teams? Because, like, obviously you keep Bo, right? By the way, Degon, you know what I love when teams make changes is mm. that they have, you know, teams like Cloud9, like Carmine Corp, that have severe problems with mid to late game shot calling. And you know what changes they make, Degon? They bring in closer from Hundred Thieves, a team when he, even when he was winning championships, was notable for its severe lack of mid to late game shot calling and their kind of macro disaster classes. And then who do we bring in to replace Fudge on a team that has no shot calling? Is it a rookie Korean player who maybe can't even speak English? <laughs> <laughs> what is this shit man like are these the changes we're really making yes yes they are but i mean the thing <laughs> is i think it's not it's not really it's not really fair to make the comparison because cloud nine is only changing one player right and top lane <laughs> you don't need like insane macro from your top laner you, you need your no, top but they need somebody to shot call they need somebody dom <laughs> sure but I mean, I think it's, it's almost never your top laner. So like, that's true. The the change is just to make their team have a stronger laning phase because Cloud9 was the team they weren't getting ahead as, as much as they would like to, um, especially top lane. It felt like Fudge was always just playing to like go even or he would just go like like behind and he would be an issue throughout the whole game. So they're just trying to add firepower to their team so that at least they can run people over early game. But Carmine Corp, number one, it's so much easier for Carmine Corp to be better than they were because they were 10th place twice, right? So it, it's not ex it's not something where it's like, it's like, oh shit, like, are they going to be better with closer than Bo? But then also there's rumors that they're changing to Abadage and someday top lane. There, there's there's rumors they're going for the 100 Thieves K Corp. Um, the other <laughs> options that, that we've heard are like Chasey potentially being there. Um, and uh, Vladi, the, the K Corp mid laner, uh, K Corp Academy mid laner is also in the mix, like, like in these discussions. So whoever they get, like they're going to just be upgrading their team. Like Bo was not the biggest issue on the team. Like I would say he was he was actually still the best player on the team, even when he was like running it down. Like maybe it, yes. in the games where he was running it down, he wasn't the best player. But overall, he was pro he was the best performer on the team. I think it's crazy that they're keeping Targumas and upset. But the whole idea here is that Targumas and Kalist liked playing together. So they're just going to keep Targumas through summer so that when Callist is ready, he can like join with Targuma. So I mean, whatever, I guess it's fine. I just think that it's, it's like so fucked up that, uh, that Bo has just like had these teams to be on out of all the teams that, that and, could have used. And him. also you could just tell from their comms too, that Bo was still really fucking trying. Like he was yes. the one who was talking the most in a second language and like really trying to get the team to do something. So I feel bad for him. Who's who's Bo's career shaped like? Was there another career that you can think of here, Dom, that no. like has had the tragedy of this? No, like no one started wasted. out as good as good as Bo. Like and went from like yeah. No no one's had the career tra trajectory of Bo, but that's also because he didn't play that long in China. He played ten games and then got suspended for match fixing, right? So he did not have like a, like he had like 10 games. Like where, where could you find a career where somebody played like half a split was considered like one of the best in the world. And then they ended up going to a lesser region and falling off to that degree. That's crazy. Mm. Uh, yeah, it, it has been a frustrating, sad mismanagement descent for, for, for Bo. Um, I, I, I want to, like, because to me, both these changes are clunky, right? Because it, what, what Dom was saying earlier is your top lane doesn't do as much shot calling, and it feels like you're getting a better upgrade of Thanatos to Fudge. However, uh, you, you're changing a lot of the shot calling from the jungle roll, but you, what Monty said, you're bringing in closer. Which one of these is going to be more impactful? 
Monty? Well, I think I, you know, I, I keep Thanatos right between him and fudge. And I, I keep Bo between him and closer. Cause I, I just don't think that closer does anything for this team. Really? You know what I mean? He's like a worse version of Bo in, in many ways. So I don't think it's the upgrade you need. Like you're not bringing in a veteran jungler who's known for like controlling objectives in the mid and late game and like shot calling his team to victory. Like that was never who closer was closer was the guy who would be mechanically sound in the early game, get you advantages and then play very badly. The longer the game went on. <laughs> so I just, I, I really fail to see what this does. Even if you do the hundred thieves reunion, I, I don't think it functions properly. I mean, I think that, that what ends up happening is that closer looks better than Bo, but just simply because he has players that know how to play competitive. That's fair. Like, so he's, so people will get the perception that closer is better than Bo, but it's only because closer is going to be playing with like Abadage or Vladi, um, and, you know, someday or chasing someday. most likely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if he's playing with those players, he's just going to have more stable lanes. They're going to be able to like fight things more often. I think the biggest problem for Bo is like, He's somebody whose biggest strength is fighting. And like people that have, like, for example, Yamato's coached him, and Yamato even said that Bo is the best mechanical player he's ever coached. That like he's never coached hmm. any, like, in any role. And this guy is coached, like, the majority in Korea. Of yeah, LAC, yeah. He's, yeah, he's yeah. coached in Korea. Like, he has had, if you go through the amount of players that Yamato has coached, it is actually insane the amount of players that he's yeah. coached. So, like, that that is insane praise coming from. Uh, Yamato, but it's like it's hard to fight when no fights actually like are advantaged. Like, how do you fight? You know, and then a lot of times he just tries to fight things that are unfightable and runs it down. As a result, like it's it's really hard to play jungle when you just have losing lanes. And I think that a lot of people just don't see this in competitive. It's like, yeah, I mean, you can do nothing and look less bad, but if you're trying to win the game with losing lanes as a jungler, a lot of the times it's going to go wrong. Like you're trying to do an impossible task. Uh, well, chat's asking what happens to Saken here. It just goes back to what the French team. He becomes Forsaken. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happens to Saken, <laughs> but I mean, like a Saken is the type of player where I watched him play, and I was trying to think about like what does this guy do well, right? So like when you look at other rookies, you could see that Jackie's has like interesting champion pool he's pretty good at melee champs you look at the yeah. other rookies that came in uh like zwyru looked pretty clutch it looked like he understood how to play a lot of situations a lot of fights for scowie as a player who was really good at like playing around bot side and roaming um individually so like, he knew how to like play the map extremely well you look at socket and socket actually does nothing well like he doesn't lane well he doesn't play mages well in terms of creating space and fights he doesn't flank well on champions like akali he doesn't have good target selection um he doesn't have good engaging when he plays Nico, he actually just does nothing well. So like, how do you play when your mid laner does nothing well? Normally, I think it's like hilarious your mid laner... to watch him because he doesn't do anything, right? He just doesn't, he's like there, but doesn't actually do anything at all in a team fight. I, I think he's actually one of the most fascinating players I've ever seen because he just kind of freezes up. Like, it's not as if he dies a lot of the time. He just like refuses to fight. He's a pacifist. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, he just looks like he's playing for like job security. You know, like he, he looks like the player that's permanently afraid of making mistakes. But I mean, even when you look at other players who are flawed, you know, like for example, people look at like Power of Evil in his in his later days and they're like, oh man, all he can do is play control mages. It's like, yeah, I'd rather have somebody who could only play control mages over somebody who can't do anything. Like Sakin doesn't do any part of playing mid lane well. There's no aspects of like how a mid laner needs to perform in fights that Sakin is normally good at or like naturally good at. It just feels like he's He's a poser, man. It looks like he's trying to make things happen that he just doesn't have the ability to do or that he doesn't like understand the timings for. And it just ends up being a mess. So the rumor was, right, Thanatos was, you know, obviously went to Cloud9, but he was hours, my sources say, hours away from signing from Carmen Corp. Does that save Bo if they get Thanatos? No. Okay. I just wanted to rub this one into the KC Corp fans. You could have had Thanatos and said. Well, uh, it's also interesting because from the notes that I read about the stream that they did about the team, it seems like Carmine Corp actually just doesn't have a lot of money. 
Like, in spite of everyone saying, like, oh, they have all the fans, they don't have money, apparently, which I find very intriguing. <clears throat> oh. oh, It's old school league. It's old school league. Lots of fans, not a, a lot of people that know how to sell well, so they don't know how to monetize their fan base. I don't know. Um, or maybe it's just a loud minority. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Well, if Tw Twitch chat says Carmen Corp is broke, if I recall correctly, um, or as far as I know, then it must be true. Thank I mean, they you, basically uh, implied Jonas. that they were, that they were kind of up against the wall when it came to the budget. So, you know, it makes sense that maybe they wouldn't be able to actually sign Thanatos at the end. Yeah, I mean, I saw, like, weird comments from K Mar C Carmine Corp fans. I mean, obviously, like, you're going to get weird Mark. comments, but there were, uh, like, comments about, like, oh, it, like, just shows how, like, Thanatos cares about money and he doesn't want to win. It's like, dude, if you're trying to win, would you rather go to Cloud9 or would you rather go to fucking KC? Like, what is this, this idea? <laughs> yeah, maybe he that, got like, the bag and the path to the trophy, guys. Yeah, weird. it's, like, better for him overall in, yeah, in both ways, you know? Like, you should, of course you should want to join Cloud9. I don't understand why he wouldn't. Because he is not joining my team, obviously. This is the best team right <laughs> oh, here. You canceled. can play with all of those. <laughs> yeah, they're not going to like that. I, French accent is one of my favorite ones to do. Sorry. <laughs> um, the other thing that we just did and spent a lot of time doing was uh, not talking about Bo and Closer. So on the opposite side with Thanatos and Fudge, we just spent a lot of time talking about fallout from other players. So one, one, one name that has that is missing from this roster is obviously Zven. How much did Zven know how to win, drive the team forward? How much of that impact is there? Uh, and how much do you think that is? Another one that we could talk about is, I think the drop off of play of Blabber. Maybe that came from having new teammates, but I don't think he was as dominant, you know, uh, as he could have been. Where do you think some of this other blame could be shouldered? Although Fudge's role is a little bit more on an island. I mean, Sven I mean, knows how to move his mouth. I'll, I'll give him that. Like, he's constantly talking. He also is just a try hard as a player. So even then, I, I don't think, like, his support play on an individual level was... I, now, it has to be said, the last couple of years, because Core JJ fell off until he got into the playoffs this time, um, and Vulcan kind of has been declining, like, I don't think support was the most competitive role. So maybe he was up there on an individual support level. but. I don't think he is like a top tier individual support player, but as a team voice and contributor, I could see him absolutely being hugely effective. Dom. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that it just feels like the team was like, it, it, they didn't have anyone that actually would pull the trigger where it felt like Zven would be very confident yeah. in how he played. And even if Zven's engages weren't super on point, I felt like his timing was actually pretty decent and he understood what needed to be done in order to win, where it feels like Vulcan is kind of a passenger at this point. So I'm, I'm hoping that Vulcan can actually become who he used to be. Like he used to have a really good eye for engages. That used to be the, the narrative around Vulcan was that he was super good at engaging um, and playing melee champs when he was terrible at playing enchanters. But now it feels like he's like scared. He's waiting for things to happen. I feel like he just needs to be more confident and go for the plays that he knows he can make when he's playing his engaged champions. Yeah, I I think Vulcan Vulcan's level early was was pretty rough, even on engaged champions. And then I think as playoffs came in, you got to see a little bit more of him. But yeah, uh, I I just I'm interested. I I I don't think that Thanatos solves all the problems. I just don't think it does. And I think you have too many good players on this Cloud Nine roster to to. You know, it's super team. Quote quote super team. This was a super team, and it didn't quite work out. And now what do we do? We made it more super, and you know, adding this hyped contract jailed player who's been talked about for a while now. So um, yeah, we'll see what Cloud Nine does there. Um, all right. Well, thank you both for your keeps and kicks for both these squads, and we'll see their trajectory and their passion for their passionate fan bases here in the upcoming split. Uh, all right. Well, next up, we want to take a second to talk about uh, one of uh, one of our great friends and sponsors of the show, one that we've talked about pretty consistently, and one of Dom's favorites. Uh, it's time for us to talk about Factor here. Factor with their stress-free 
spring ready to eat meals every fresh never frozen meal is chef crafted dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes choose from a weekly menu of 35 options including popular options like calorie smart keto protein plus or vegan and veggie also discover more than 60 add-ons every week like breakfast on the go snacks and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long get started today and fuel up for your springtime goals they have great chef prepared meals on the table in two minutes with factors ready to eat meals so you can get back doing what you love this spring so generally i pop into queue i run downstairs turn it on <laughs> go back to you quickly pick my champ you know everyone's kind of done that well factor definitely <laughs> allows me to do that and not miss a beat when i am uh rolling in solo queue it's really easy no mess no cleanup go and throw away afterwards they've had some delicious combos with their meals like filet mignon shrimp truffle butter broccolini and asparagus to make sure that you get both your protein and your veggies and it's tailored to your schedule you can go ahead and customize the weekly meals with flexibility to get as much or as little as you need and it has been great to us here monty yep it's been awesome i will be able to use it myself finally when i get back from, i'm leaving back to the states in a week and i'll be staying in the states for a month so i will finally be able to try all of dom's recommendations which is very exciting for me um but yeah they've been a they, they've been a great partner and dom now you're back in the states you can go back to enjoy it yourself yep yeah i had to turn it back on the second i i got back they come on tuesday so i've already uh put back in my uh, my um my subscription and i'm ready to keep on going with factor there you go you heard from us head on over to factormeals.com slash power spike 50 and use the code power spike 50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next box make sure to head on over do that and solve your meal needs on the go without sacrificing taste that's power spike 50 at factormeals.com slash power spike 50 to get 50 percent off your first box plus 20 percent off your next box while your subscription is active thanks to our friends over at factor for being a supporter of power spike and our lifestyles because again we we use it so thank you guys uh all right last topic of the day again we've had uh, less matches but still shit that we have to talk about where it's almost like two two hour shows here uh we have the matches themselves yes the productions were great but big matches t1 gen g g2 fanatic the classy co as well and then blg top esports uh galaxy brain club let's get into it all right guys uh the matches have been set so uh er, i guess the matches have been done and the final match waiting to see uh uh the seating for the lpl has been set blg and top esports again top esports taken down jdg uh last weekend uh when we think about iconic plays right what i think just game one game one of both lck series we're just crazy and gave you everything that you wanted. But I just think about the faker, Azir, there's no hope, game's over, they're about to lose. Just one, two, three autos, kills four people, dies, and then the game continues on. Like, I mean, you, you think like about that. The Gen G series was amazing. I, it was a great play by faker. I think about the fact that three people were dead, including the enemy jungler, and Gen G has Callista, and they walk into a choke point. That's what I think about, instead of just finishing <laughs> yeah. a fucking Elder Drake. Uh, that would be my number one complaint. But if an enemy team is going to be mind controlled, you might as well make a banger play like Faker did. So, you know, you could make a bad, you could make a good play off of an enemy team's bad play, but it was super dumb by Genji. Yeah. 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 Let, let's start there. Five game series, best of uh, one of the best finals in recent history, I'd say. It was close. You know, we got all five. We got the silver scrapes. We had the epic. Uh, atmosphere when you think about that series dom what 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 jumps out of you um i mean i think the the number one thing that jumps out is chovy's level of play throughout like the entire series like he felt like the the main character the entire time um just like the, like he just felt like he was you know the guy who was going to win every game and even when t1 won games it felt like they were just trying to like stop chovy from being able to do 
what he wanted to do. I mean, the the Rally and Soul game that they lost, it felt like Chobi dies one time. Okay, the game's finally fucking over. You know, like one bad death and, and the game is instantly over. Um, also, I thought like the macro in game number one from Gen G was oh good. It was like some of the best I think I've ever seen. Like the way that as soon as Aatrox picked up the Hex Drinker, they buy boots of they already bought boots of, of uh, swiftness on Rumble, so that Rumble could then go like match lanes late. Like you can run to lanes faster than Aatrox, and they abuse this to then swap the bot lane into the top lane, so the Hex Drinker is useless. He's playing versus an AD champ. And then the Rumble is able to just catch waves all over the map. Like the way that they played lane to lane to lane, like everyone was swapping. It looked so insanely practiced. Um, so I was really impressed by that. I just thought that like, I, I didn't know that they they had it in them. It, it, they didn't have anything else like that throughout like the entire series. They didn't have like a super out macro moment um, when it came to like lane assignments in, in the rest of the series. But that like early portion in game one that was, was really good. pretty insane. Um, I also think it's impressive that they were able to do that without Peanut, because obviously Peanut has been such a core to this team's championship successes. And for them to, you know, on top of what Dom's saying about Chovy, we have to remember that Chovy is now one of the main shot callers of this team, whereas it was like 100% Peanut before, and now the duties are, are kind of split between Lehens and Chovy. And so for Chovy and Lehens to execute this... I think was even more impressive to me because that was what we were wondering what if Gen G was going to be missing. And you see the start of this game and you're like, holy shit. Wow. Like they still have it in them. And that's that's really fun. Um, because not only do we get these very impressive individual performances from Chovy, not only in terms of like, you know, team fighting, but just in terms like this had this was just the complete Chovy performance. And he was robbed of MVP, by the way. And I say this as Keen's fucking biggest fan, but he was robbed. Um, he's winning lanes. He has no business winning. Like Faker is literally like trying to play Halo Blades Azir to keep him down. And he's like going even. He's just chilling in these lanes, doing great. Not only that, but the balls on this guy. So they, you know, everybody is just banning Faker's Oriana. He's like, all right, let it through. Game five, everything on the fucking line. Faker's been dominating with the Ori. He's been smashing people in the lane with the Ori. I'm just going to play Corky into it. And you know what? Like I'm going to fucking horrible. win. It's, it's a horrible so, matchup. <laughs> it's, it's so insanely hard to play. If you watch how he's playing the matchup, he's just like, like normally the reason why Oriana just shits on all these lanes is because Oriana just puts the ball in front of you. You can't really dodge it and you just get like QW'd over and over again. And there's like no counterplay. But somehow Chovy is like walking around the ball. Like he's like walking into bait faker spells and walking around. Like if you watch how Chovy lanes, his like, play around ability ranges and around hitboxes is the best in the world it's, it's just crazy to watch him just walk directly on the edge of the skill shot every single time so he did that in the the talia matchup when he was uh playing i think it was a zero versus talia and then he did it again while playing into into oriana where he's just playing corky into oriana and he's just dodging like the majority of the cues coming out of faker like he made faker look like a bad oriana but faker is the best oriana in lck and it's perma ban versus him so it's really crazy to uh to to see how well he played throughout. And yeah, I mean he just performed then even at the end of the game the game, like end of game five, buys GA packages straight into flash packages into the whole enemy team to like engage for his team. Like this guy is a champion now. Like he's serious. I I think Chovy is like is extremely underrated right now by the community. Like I, I don't know why people don't speak better about him. I understand that like internationally he hasn't had like the success that you're looking to, but if you just watch his individual play. He plays at a higher level than anyone else in the world right now. I, I think it's just, again, people just want to count those championships on the world stage, and it's very loud T1 fan base, you know, kind of holding on to, here's the world championship, and figures has been doing it longer, but this is such a dominant trophy. I don't know what it takes, because well. Chovy is just like clapped Faker's cheeks four times in a row now. I, at what point, T1 fans, and Faker is the greatest player of all time. And actually, this was one of the less dominant finals from Chovy, if we're being honest. If you go back and watch some of these other finals that have been played, Chovy usually claps him harder than he does in this series. Yeah, I mean, I didn't feel like Faker was playing particularly no, bad fine. in this series. I, I think that Faker was maybe the second best player on T1 over the course of the, the series. It's just like there's just a beast on the other team that's taking over games. And I thought that, like, the other thing, if we want to talk about T1 side, 
um, that was tough to watch. Is I feel like Caria has completely lost the ability to play like meta champions. Like his Rakan is not scary. His Nautilus is not scary. It feels like if he's not on some weird pick where it's like Nico or like the um, like Ash support, if it's ever like, I mean, Ash Varus is pretty much never up first then, but if Ash Varus is ever up, he could play that. Um, you know, if he's playing, you know, what's weird about that, Dom, is a couple years ago when this roster first formed, yeah, Nautilus, even out of meta, was perma banned against Caria because he was yeah. so fucking good, and people thought about as Nautilus yeah, I remember as in 2022. champion. Yeah, so I, you know, I, mean, I wonder if he's just out of practice on the champion right now because it's very. I agree with you, but it's weird if you think about Caria's professional arc that we would be saying this. Yeah, I mean, he looks like he could only play the weird stuff. He can only play like tanks, like Sejuani and and Orin and stuff when he has um a center on his team and i think that was a big liability like if i wanted to go through t1 players i know that they trucked zeus randomly t1 fans decided to truck zeus um yeah he's apparently he didn't play the, the rex eye yeah i think he's the best player on this he's, yeah he didn't play the rex eye he played vein into rex eye which was a hard counter pick and every time that rex eye was taken people had to ban vein because he was so good at that side of the matchup and then when he played into rex eye it's not like he was getting clapped by the fucking rex eye like that's not why he was losing I don't think that if, if I think that the way that that T1 wins games is by having Zeus on a counter pick and then having their bot lane play something strong. Like they like to play like mid jungle supporting the side lanes on T1. I don't think that the recipe is for Zeus to play weak side. If he plays weak side, he has to be playing something like Asante that later on can like take a lot of space in fights. I think that's the strength of the team. So I don't even agree with the fact that Zeus playing Rek'Sai is somehow going to make the team have a better result in this final. I think that it would actually make them have a worse result. I think you want them to have uh, the, the counter pick. So when I look at, at the team, I think Zeus is the best performer on this team. Over the course of spring, I thought he was the best player on the team. I think he's the main reason why they even made it to finals. Um, Faker, I would say, is the second best player on the team. Owner is like hit or miss. He can like when owner is bad, he's the worst player on the team. When he's good, though, he's really fucking solid, right? And I think Guma was like stable as well. I think that at this point, the biggest question mark when it comes to T1's performance performance is Caria. I think Caria is arguably the worst individual player on T1. I mean, I think owner struggles when the bot lane isn't winning, but I think the problem is that also this team has a very definitive style, like you point out, Dom, which is like even even it, regardless of meta, like if you think about when they were at their peak, such as last spring, you know, it, yep. Faker has been a low economy, highly high efficiency mid laner, meaning that he takes very little gold compared to other mid laners, but he does quite a bit of damage, not the most damage, not like Chovy, right? Yeah. Um, with that, like with that gold that he gets. Yeah, he, yeah. And he he is really good, and he, it, it's his macro, right? So they play, I agree, Dom, they play to support the side lanes. But if bot lane isn't winning and owner doesn't have the, the like kind of the push in bot lane, he often seems lost on the map. And it's like there are very specific conditions that have led to this team's success. And when they have these conditions, they look fucking great, right? And if they don't have these conditions, they could even still make it competitive because Faker is able to shot call very well from behind and they can cross map and they've got their little sneaky Barons and everything like that. And they're the best team at like knowing when to take Baron in the world, probably like probably right. Um, and they, they have so many different kind of plays around Baron that are that have been really fun to watch, whether they're on blue side or red side and the champions they've selected. They, they like know their limits around taking Baron extremely well. Um, but the thing is, is that it's it's led to a method of playing the game where if they get thrown off their groove, they have to play from behind. And even if they are pretty good at doing that, playing from behind in League of Legends is just fundamentally really fucking hard. I mean, um, the, the thing is, their ball lane is not close to as dominant as they were when it comes to like lane sure. understandings. Like you watch, for example, the the way that they played the Lushanami lanes into the Philios Lulu, like they, they were just straight, like Pays was actually just, just murdering in that lane. And if it wasn't for the fact that owner solo killed Canyon, and, and I believe it was game two or game three, I think it was game two, where it was like a uh, Zen versus Sejuani, he solo kills Canyon, and then he bails out the bot lane. They were gonna have horrible conditions, and that was gonna snowball into like a 20, 30 CS um, deficit while you're getting outscaled. You're getting outscaled by the Philios, and you're gonna be down 20 to 30 CS because of how poorly they played um the early the early lane phase so i think the issue right now is that like it doesn't feel like there's that many things you need to permaban against t1's bot lane like before at worlds the whole issue was like holy fuck what do we do against their bot lane like 
if they if, if we ban ash they're gonna play like senna support they're gonna play fucking all this weird shit like they're gonna play varus every single time it's up caitlin like there's lux. All, yeah caitlin lux there's all these issues that you had um with their balling but right now it's like you kind of just don't want to give them varus ash like that's pretty much it it's like you can give them anything outside of varus ash and it's probably going to be okay for you bot lane which is not how it felt at worlds it's not how it felt at spring um and uh spring 2023 and that's why i feel like t1 is a very meta dependent team like they're always a scary team they could always end up winning msi it just feels like the meta is not conducive to what they're good at especially if you consider the fact that like draven was turbo buffed and stuff draven is good for them um and and guma is a good draven but we saw what happened when he got draven in the series like he needs Caria to be on forum to be able to be the draven player that he can be i mean i do think the senna ban is smart against them and we you know we we basically saw senna perma banned red side by whoever was there because pays can play it as well um but that also opens up some of Caria's more weird picks where he can play yeah. like the orn or the sejuani supports with tp and then have a really big effect on the game because uh t1 plays very well with teleport and the more teleports you give them the more weird ass cross mapping they do or secret barons they do right so um well, i do and, think and that can that go is like unsealed well. spellbook and they can do like the double smite which plays into yeah. like how they like to do baron yeah yeah uh just thank you for that breakdown especially specifically on this the the, the carrier thing it just feels like uh i think carrier did have a very good nico game though yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah i mean i'd say that that's that's the thing is like he can play the the nico but nico is pretty much only playable with varus and Callista right now is, is how people view it so it's like okay i mean he can play play nico with Callista. it's not something that's super meta um and i just need to see him like play more of the like it doesn't feel like it's scary to give him you know lulu with affilios it's not scary to give him nami it's not scary to give him sure. uh like ash if he's not playing with a varus he just doesn't have that same impact on the game that he did have at, at worlds you know it, it felt like his picks would always be one of the most crucial parts of the game oh did he get a good bard lane like okay the is is he getting like one of his, his range champions that he can just stomp the lane with like is he able to play any of like the unique uh like champions like for example the nico does he have any of those like pocket picks that you're afraid of it just felt like the the draft really was oriented around his counters but now people don't care about his counters like genji didn't care that much about bot lane counters like they were banning other stuff yeah um well they have uh msi to try and cook something up and get carry it back into form also, like, I would like to see a return to form for Guma as well, right? It goes hand in hand, and we're getting to see how the, the duo affect each other. Um, all right, let's move on over to G2 and Fnatic, since that series was also already in the past. G2 Fnatic. Well, I want to say one, one last thing, like, yeah. about the end of that series. It was very, like, I love what we saw from Canyon towards the end of that series, too, which is, like, they took a lot of big risks, like obviously playing Kha'Zix in a non Kha'Zix meta um, was a really interesting move. And yeah, then boy. drawing the Kha'Zix ban, but also, and I think this one flew under the radar a little bit, Canyon playing Poppy is super fucking weird. You see a lot of Poppy players um, in LCK, particularly Owner and Peanut, right? Um, and you think that, oh, it's not so weird. Canyon had not played a game of Poppy this year, and he played one game of Poppy last year. So this has not been a pick for him. It was a very good pick in the circumstances that he selected it, obviously. But this also would have come out of left field, probably, for the T1 coaches. Because even when Poppy has been highly used by other teams, and it is generally a good pick in the pro meta, like, Canyon was really out there doing some weird shit for Canyon. And this is the kind of clutch factor that you want when you get a player of Canyon's caliber and when a big important match is on the line, right? Like, I don't want to see any more fucking Canyon trundle in game fives. Like the Poppy's a great pick. The Kha'Zix like really worked in the way that he played it. I, I'm not sold on the pick, right? Because I think <laughs> it could have gone very badly in that game because they had no engage, like no crowd control. But the way that he was able to isolate owner um, and get the picks they needed was good. And also it allowed them to do Baron very quickly, which was a pretty big bonus in that game as well. 
Um, yeah. So, like, I think they used it effectively, but it, it could have gone really badly. Um, and then the pop pick about was... the the Kazakhs pick. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. I think it's interesting. I mean, the, the so the apparent the uh, apparently the thing that was that was uh that was noted in like the the post game uh, press conference was that. Kanan actually credited Chovy for recommending Kazakhs in that situation. Like, I think that... No that, way. Yeah, which is something that I thought was, like, pretty... Like, that's pretty base to realize that your your teammate is struggling on, like, tank picks and being like, dude, you're, like, you were the best carry jungler in the fucking world. Like, just play, like, Kazakh. Play, like, something that you play in solo queue really well. And, like, let's fucking get this dub. And I think that that was... That just shows that this team has a level of trust. Like, that Canyon is willing to trust Chovy like that and Chovy trusts Canyon the same. You know, like, they're trying to bring the best out of each other i feel like that is something that really helps build a team when it comes to like going forward because it's very rare that you're going to skate to an international title without like having to win some really intense do or die games and in those do or die games you need to be willing to play to the strengths of your team and be aware of what is happening in the series like you can prep for the series all you want but then you get on stage and it's like it doesn't matter if sejuani had been working for canyon the entire fucking year Sejuani was not working in that series. The tank junglers were not working well in that series at that point in the series. So being like good teammates like that and being able to to lift each other up, I think is a really crucial part of building yourself into an international champion. I didn't know that. It's a good point. And and also, also, I mean, it's just the Kha'Zix, you know, working into Gwen and Jin Zhao when he can get isolated damage against those champions is like super good. Um, but you, you know, I, it also, I think really depended on him finding owner alone. And like he, I think part of it was the realization that owner was playing a little bit too aggressively in the rest of the series on Jin Zhao. So if, you know, he did meet up with Canyon and he kind of just inted into Canyon a couple of times, right? It's like, he didn't respect the Kazakhs damage, uh, at points in time. So I think it was a good read on the way that owner was playing in the series also. So it, it ended up working, but it was definitely more of a feel thing rather than this is like objectively a super good pick in this situation. Yep. Yeah. Ch- Chad saying someone in chat was saying the, that that was uh, summarized. The team suggested Jax and Kazix, and everyone said Jax except Chovy, who said Kazix, and then everyone went with Kazix. Yeah, I linked the, um, yeah, the I tweet here cool. from the post game press conference. Okay, sweet. Yeah. And also for the Poppy pick, like, right, you you know, it, it's it's super good into the Zach engage, and the Zach engage gave them trouble in the game that they lost because they were actually doing a pretty bad job of peeling for Pays's affiliates. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it gave them so, help into the Zach engage, but what really helped the Zach engage is the fact that Keen absolutely fucking murdered him sure, in lane. True, and made it so he was just like not a champion in that game. <laughs> that was like, the biggest help. But the theory behind the Poppy pick is like very good, obviously, because yeah. you play the Lucian very far forward, right, to get the poke damage. So if you can get the Poppy W down, you limit Lucian's mobility. He also just can't play as far forward. And Zach engage is like really easy to stop with Poppy, uh, Poppy W. Um, so I think that's that was a that was a nice pick. But like I said, that would have been another one where sure Canyon may have been playing it in scrims for the past couple of years, but he's not the Poppy God that Owner or Peanut are right it's not a signature champion and for him to this was the first game he had like he had played one other poppy game in the last two years guys and he pulls it out in game five that's fucking that's that's yeah. big balls yep and they do it against one of faker's most you know strongest champions a la edg msi throwback against the undefeated uh leblanc so uh just a great product overall. What a series. And that, I mean, look, the finals was just fucking mega, right? This is one of, I mean, I think you make an argument that this is the best LCK finals of all time. Yeah, I think it is right? the best final LCK finals of all time. Like, when it comes to how the games also felt, like, not only is it the team that was 2-1 two, two, down that ended, up, that ended up winning the series, but every game felt tense, even the ones that were, like, kind of stomps. Like, I mean, when you look at, at the last game, like, you, you, you watch this game five, it's like a 45 minute close game. You look at the kill score and it's like 14 to two Gen G. So, so by looking at that, it would make you feel like they got, like they pretty much stomped T1. It didn't feel like a stomp. It felt like if they misplayed once the game was over, if either team misplayed one team fight late, they're just going to lose. 
Well, game one, too, was such a masterclass yep. by Gen G in the early game. And then there were a couple of little throws in there. Happy gaming. Uh, and even though it was, there was some happy gaming, and even though T1, it, it felt constantly like an uphill battle for them to win, they made it more interesting that that game had any right to be. Yep. Yeah. Um, do you think that this is the greatest series in LC, uh, finals in LCK history? Let us know in the comments. What other ones come to mind? Do you have any that come? Uh, so for me, the two big ones are actually one of the ones that happened in the same stadium, which is uh, summer 2016 between the Rocks Tigers and KT. That was the one where Smeb stole the final Baron from score with like two HP with a gangplank gold, which was like one of the craziest ends to a game five. Um, the other one would I mean, be obviously the the, the, the Faker KT? Ryu Zed versus Zed final. Yeah, yeah the KT yeah. SKT is the Faker. What was or, that? Um, the final one that probably people would talk about was the 2014 summer final between KT Arrows and Samsung Blue was another extremely good series. Yeah. I mean, it's just the, the, that like, I guess for, for that final, it just felt like it, it felt weird. I mean, I guess it's kind of retrospect. It felt weird because that was like people didn't know Rookie was Rookie back then. You know, like Rookie was like, who the fuck is this guy? Like, who is this this, this player? So like, I think that was different. And then also there, it, it just felt not as hype because back then qualifying to worlds was it you, you didn't qualify to worlds by winning the final so like the final had less importance on it it still was all championship points so like the fact that kt arrows won that final and then didn't go to worlds i thought was like extremely weird like you're watching the final and you're like okay they can win but they're not they, they like had a bad spring so they're not guaranteed to go i felt like that kind of killed the hype for me in that final i don't know it's pretty fun also, that was the that was the beach the finals on the beach. So it was like yeah, pretty yeah. epic in terms of setting. It was it was a yep. fun one. Now that I also Kakao is a fucking hero on Nocturne in that series. It was great. Yeah. That was a really good one though. But you asked for other contenders, so there there uh, throughout a handful of uh, you know factually guys. Most LCK LCK finals have been fucking terrible. They're yeah. like three zero. They're giga boring. So there aren't that many to pick from. Um, so this is definitely up. It's it's like top three, probably for sure. Yeah, I mean, I and then the, you could decide if you like it as the best one or not. I mean, part part of that is because the format used to be so garbage for LCK finals. Like it used to be that if you were first in regular season, you just go to yeah. the finals. Like that's how like you were first in regular season, you're in the finals. So it's like you don't build that storyline or anything like throughout the. the right. The, and that's why the, that's season. also why two two of the other finals we're talking about were not part of that format. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we'll never have a Z versus Z. What was that? Just blind pick. What 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 did we call it? Blind pick game fives, pick. baby. Yeah, blind pick game five. People, the kids don't know that that's how they used to do it in LCK only. It was draft, 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 <laughs> and it's like, all right, you guys have drafted each other on sides. Just blind pick. You know, and guess what? The other players can play. It, both it's of them probably for the best that that doesn't happen anymore. But yeah, yeah, it was so fun. It was so fun. Um, all right, from that. Let's move to uh, LEC finals. We had G2, El Clasico, G2, and Fnatic go at it once again uh, with uh, G2 ripping off three wins in a row. And we've talked about the feeling of it, but gameplay wise, uh, what stood out for you here, Monty? Uh, I was not this a was fan a of this series. series. <laughs> this was a tough series to watch, it was a really hard series to watch. Because it feels like I mean I'll 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 go ahead because Monty looks like he's in pain. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I think that uh, it just it it felt like G two was playing way under their level. Like it also is extremely weird yeah. because it wasn't like they were just doing like lane swaps like when it looked good. Like they went into the series. G two went into the series and they were like we're lane swapping every game no matter what. Yeah, like, it's like picking we're picking things. Scion first three picks, like super obvious. Yeah. And you just kind of like sitting and be like, it. all right, here it comes, boys. You know what's funny, though, is like they actually got mega advantages out of it anyway. Like, I think if they had played through some of the scenarios even better, like Oscar and wouldn't have been even been a champion in game number one had they like frozen the yeah. wave or like bounced the wave off the tier one turret. And I, I actually asked G2 about this. And, uh, you know, I don't I don't because I, I was very curious as to, like, what they were doing in that first game, because, like, in the mm -hmm. traditional sense, um, they they wouldn't they like in the old school style of lane swapping, you know, you would bounce that wave off the tier one and then freeze it at your own tier one. And so their their top laner would have to overextend and he would be like level two for the for like the next 10 minutes. 
um, mm -hmm. or die, right? Um, and so I, I just ask, because, like, you know, the game has changed a lot, obviously. Uh, since that time period, we have plates now, for example. And uh, I, I, I don't think I, this is, I don't think this is like sharing, oversharing anything that I was told. I'm not going to share everything. But basically, the thrust of it was that in their scrims, they weren't used to the turret, top turret going down so quickly. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, normally it doesn't like the thing is, I felt like Fnatic also didn't prep like we knew G2 was going to attempt this based on what they did the previous week, right? Like we knew that this was at least going to be in their arsenal. And then when G2 did it like in the most obvious way possible, like we are first pick, like it's like Tristana, Scion, Lulu. Yeah. like they're just yeah, no demolish Lulu. Let's fucking go. <laughs> that I thought the response so funny. was so bad from Fnatic. I thought the response was yeah. terrible from Fnatic. Like they didn't take yeah. demolish themselves. Like they didn't play. Like they they looked like they didn't know it was coming, when it was obviously coming. Um, so they could have they could have matched the lanes. I mean, they could have done a million things to try to actually um get ahead in that circumstance. They they could have done the actual lane swap deep wards that yeah. Sure. What they should have practiced? Like I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Man. It was fucking. Sure. Weird. I mean, or they could have just played like. I don't think they need to match there. I think that they they could potentially just play the way they did, but they should just take demolish and like really try to force down the bot turret. Like same way that Oscar, Oscar also, also looked completely turret. clueless. This like he didn't know where to be at any point yeah. in time. But I mean, that's, I, I feel I, like that's, that's what true. made the final. He did get a he did get a, a deep tier two freeze in the first game. Um, and they actually, he did catch up in levels as a result of that. So at that one point in time, he knew where to be, but the rest of it, the rest of the series yeah. was kind of a nightmare. I'll just say that it was, um, it was weird to watch because it was like, man, can G2, cause the first game G2 does the swap and they lose, right? Like they end up losing that game, not because of the swap, but just, they end up losing the game. Like they don't have a great comp. They mess up some fights later on. And then game two, they do it again. And it feels like they should just lose game two. And it's like, man, if they lose this game too, can they please just play normal? Because you feel like G2 is the better team, right? Like you, everyone feels like G2 is the best team in Europe. Um, and then game two is like the most egregious fanatic throw of all time. It's just so disgusting how they throw the game. It's such a hard watch. So then once that ends up finishing, like it just is like, how could G2 lose the series? You know, like almost all the hype was lost. It's like, if G2 won that game, they're just going to win the, the rest of the series, like for sure. Like that, that's how it felt. So I'd say overall, like the, the gameplay was not good. Like G2, I mean, essentially the way I judge Europe is like, how well is G2 playing? You know, because they're like the bar and Pretty it fair. felt like G2 played poorly and they still won 3-1 pretty convincingly, I would say. So I don't know. It's kind of tough there. Also, Humanoids Aurelian Soul is hilarious. I'm just going to put that up there. <laughs> yeah and oh, again man. uh the, we had on uh one of our other shows on inside on esports with thorin and peter dunn saying that the g2 players are on inverse schedule they're already sleeping on uh, china time so that they can prep their bodies and to, to combat jet lag for when they fly on over so they man, they went on stage really that bad like i don't get no jet sleep. lag like what is jet lag like you don't get jet lag <laughs> No, like what I is that? It. Like what what is jet lag? Like I just like go to the new time zone and then I'm just like I just wake up at the time that's normal to wake up there like instantly. Uh I, what, what do you how do you feel when you get jet lagged, Monty? Uh very foggy, tired yeah. out of it. D like my appetite gets fucked up. Damn. Yeah. It it feels like do you know when like you get the flu and you're like i feel like i got something coming on and then all of a sudden just like boom your levels go low like that's what yeah. jet lag feels like without the like sick weak. yeah yeah you just feel weak and foggy like it's not yeah. like the sick part but like weak and foggy and you want like your body wants sleep whether or not the sun's out or not and it just I like you, i feel like it's so hard to sw to switch to the schedule though like when you're not in that time the zone. thing is we know we know dom doesn't have a circadian rhythm because he just like wakes up in the middle of the night to do lpl maybe he's just immune yeah. d-gun yeah. <laughs> yeah i just... never got jet lag i never got jet lag even he, when he, I was he, he, he he's he all the rest of us are weak because we actually have circadian rhythms through years <laughs> of co-streaming he has defeated his circadian rhythm and now he is immune to jet lag yeah at first and it was 
<laughs> jet lag is a social construct. Jet lag is face news. Now it's Dom's just an ascended human. He's transcended jet lag. <laughs> I mean, it's a trade off, right? I have no circadian rhythm and I'm immune to jet lag. But on the other side of things, I'm like extremely testy. And if you, you know, cross me in any way, then I'm going to fucking make videos on you and call you an idiot and a liar. So, I mean, it is what it is. <laughs> Maybe that's the key. Toxicity consumes you, but you don't have jet lag. Yeah, I'm just irritable. <laughs> <laughs> that's also a, a sign of jet lag. Yep. Um, ah, uh, shit. What was my point? I was going to be. Oh, maybe G2 are also ascended humans. They just needed to find a way to make uh, winning <laughs> LEC fun. I mean, they are yeah. ascended humans compared to the rest of LEC. I can tell you that. <laughs> I think it's a stretch calling the rest of LEC humans, but I mean, we can agree or disagree. <laughs> uh, Fnatic making it that far, uh, just a lot of championship points for them. They probably then slot in, you know, at least either the top seed of the gauntlet going into the championship or, um, yeah, 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 like one of the top seeds there. But Monty, it's this duo that you just can't get rid of. You can't get rid of them, the cranky couple. Like, who stands out on Fnatic for you? Because they are clearly, consistently, the number two team in uh, Europe. I or Razor World's caliber one. team. Look, Razor's still really good. I thought Jun had a very good playoff run, to his credit. I mean, even in these finals, he was making a lot of the plays in the engages oh. that were getting Fnatic in there. So that was a really pleasant glow up, I found. But I don't know what they're going to do with Oscar and in, in this team. Like, I just feel like he's probably the, the one that is underperforming the most right now. Noah, I don't think had a super good regular season, but even he, I thought was slightly, you know, was better in the playoffs. So I, the top lane really feels like a weakness right now for Fnatic. Um, the problem is the, you know, G2 is both individually extremely good and more than the sum of their parts when it comes to, you know, prep coaching shot calling in the game and even when they do stupid shit it just feels in, like they are inevitable right like they know they are in inevitable dom brought it up earlier like why the fuck is hans like running around the map flashing for a pentakill like a moron when yike should be one just like running around after noah well noah well, well uh hansama runs mid with jinx on the on the pushed wave and just wins the fucking game yeah, I mean, what right? makes me nervous they, they about They don't them, do that. What, what makes me nervous about G2 is, like, sure, like, I don't think that uh, Hans will make that mistake again. Like, obviously, going for a pentakill instead of winning the game is, like, Instead of winning cringe. the series. <laughs> yeah, winning, winning, winning a championship. Like, you literally <laughs> could win a championship, but you're choosing to play for kills instead. Like, that's pretty cringe. I actually well, saw G2 but... members after, uh, after this, and, like, I even talked to, like, Romain, and I was like, What's your opinion on this? Because like I thought that was like fucked, and then he's like, yeah, yeah, no, like that's some bullshit. Like we're not gonna be doing that shit in the future, you know? Like we had a talk. But, about but here's that the thing, Tom. Like, they all agreed in the moment as a team that that was the thing to do. Like I want to hear the comms because I bet you everybody on the team is like, Hans, go for the pentakill. Yeah. I don't think he was. I don't think he like was you know went rogue and made himself. that decision. <laughs> yeah, because like obviously Yike was trying to help him, so clearly it was a team call. Yeah, I mean, well, Yike should be doing that regardless of what Hans does. Yike should just be chasing him regardless. So, sure, yeah. I'm not, so I'm not sure. Like, the recall. I mean, just either way, it's like, they, the only reason they're doing that is, is um, yeah, like you said, the only reason they're doing that is because they don't feel, like, threatened. They feel like they're going to win no matter what. But the other thing I would say, the reason why I'm worried about G2 is, like, you can't have the two team fights before that. You can't have the two team fights where Hans has flash and he's like the mega carry and he doesn't flash and he dies first. <laughs> if that happens, you're getting rolled by literally all four Asian teams. Like not even close. Like top BLG, T1, Gen G, they're taking care of you, no problem. So that's why I'm worried about G2 because like their bar is like, I think they should be the best Western team. I think they probably are, even though they don't look like it. I still trust them more than I trust like TL, um, for example. But the way that they like play games out, the amount of mistakes they're making, I just don't think that they're going to put themselves in positions where they can just recover. Like you make one of these mistakes versus an Asian team and it's just over. Like you just lose that game. It's like, yeah, we didn't flash. We should have flashed. We even saw it last year. We saw it um, at MSI yep. when they played against BLG, right? 
when Hans was playing uh, versus BLG, we saw the same exact thing happen where it looked like they were going to win that series. Like Elk made like a crucial mistake and it felt like, oh man, G2 is going to win this game. They're going to be up 2-1. Maybe they're better than BLG. Maybe BLG is the worst Asian team um, at, at that international. And then Hans made one mistake and BLG just won the game, cleaned them up in the fourth. I, I was about to say, Dom, this, you saying that made me feel deja vu. I was like, we've 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 talked about Hans not flashing before, uh, important fights, and that doesn't take away from how great he can be as a player, how great he's been to that point. But then in those, I mean, it moments, does take away from both of those things really specifically. But that's fine. Yeah. Well, I, I, up to that point, up to that point in that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, that's your job. Like, you you can't deal damage if you die when you, especially when you have the tools to to avoid that in a way that we know that Eastern players can do and normally do it's a normal thing that they do whereas now this is becoming a normal thing that hans does he gets put in those positions then doesn't have it there so it, it felt very deja vu so thanks for bringing that up um monty you're gonna make a point sorry i think you're gonna make a point. Nah, I'm, I'm done with this like g2 the other thing too is that g2 was already looking ahead to MSI. And that was very clear because they had already qualified by winning winter. And I think that one of the things, you know, the problem with the the, the current um, LEC okay. format is that you have to give meaning to the winter split win. But by giving meaning to the winter split win, it took away pretty much all, like, sure, you're still fighting for seeding and like not playing in play-ins, which is important, obviously. But it's clear that G2 was not taking this as seriously as they would have had this been an MSI spot on the line or not. You know what I mean? Because they were already thinking about MSI because they had already qualified. And, and generally, <laughs> the team that you give that qualification to for the winter split because you have to give it is a team that's going to be battling in spring split where stuff like this could happen, right? Yeah. Like, it, I don't know what a solution. What do you think a solution is for that? Is there a solution for that? Because it feels, it feels like when you think about merit, it is correct. But now you have this potential issue that comes up. I think it's, I think it's tough. Like you can adjust the championship points so that it makes it likely for them to, you know, get into MSI. Um, you could also, uh, yeah, I think, I think it's tough. I'd have to sit down and like really like hash it out with numbers and see what I could do with it. But it's it's hard because you do want to give the winter split meaning. It's it's also harder because if you know if the rest of the world was on three splits and we could have another international tournament in between winter and spring, that would be the ideal solution to this problem, right? Mm, what a good suggestion. Yep. Surely uh, the esports World Cup is not some sort of uh, test for a possible third international permanent tournaments that would be taking place between a winter and a spring split surely that's not the case right guys oh uh, one one could hope a third party tournament outside of riot in 2024 you know it, it's all it's almost like they've said that they're interested in returning to third party systems and you know there is very conveniently this event that used to have a league of legends tournament called iem katowice that is now owned by the Saudi Arabian government that happens in February every year. That could be a very convenient time in between a, a winter and spring split. I don't know. I don't know, guys. All right. Well, we'll see what the future has in store. Just like what we're about to do here. BLG Top Esports LPL final. It's our last one that we're going to talk about. Obviously, you got to talk about the JDG Top Esports matchup for it. But let's 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 tackle both here in the LPL. Dom. Uh, what did you make of that series that uh, played last week before we get in predictions? Uh, wait, you said BLG Top Esports or the JDG one? Uh, JDG first. Okay, JDG first. I mean, the JDG series, uh, it just feels like JDG just doesn't have their, their like mojo anymore. Like they don't have the ability to just rock up to any team fight and just win it. Um, I thought the most surprising thing about JDG Top Esports was the fact that uh, when they were playing, they didn't win the fights like the team fights where they actually had setup advantage like when they were there first which used to be a huge strength of, of jdg and one of the weaknesses of, of top esports felt like top esports in in regular season they weren't they like were a team that needed to be ahead early game in order to beat you but jdg would just win every single objective fight so watching the changes watching it become a thing where now it's about 
top esports getting the setups and top esports if they get into team fights they feel like they can win i thought that was really strange because that's what jdg has been good at for years so um yeah it, that was the the most concerning thing is that top esports ended up beating jdg at jdg's own game I, I also think that you, you have to remember what propelled JDG to the success that they had in spite of downgrading in both of their solo lanes uh, was like Kanavi having like an MVP caliber split. Like he was, I think he, what he was second in MVP voting tonight, right, Dom? And yeah, he was yeah. a very legitimate candidate uh, for that. And he, so he the most individual MVPs. Yeah, he he really has had a great split. And like the Flandre Sheer experiment had been going pretty well, but they didn't want Sheer in for the playoffs. And so you end up in a situation where, especially like the last couple of games, 369 is extremely dominant. And I I, I just think it's it's hard because top esports just kind of has pound for pound better players. I mean, it may be surprising too, but Jackie Love might be the best AD carry in China right now. Um, when we look at you know he, rulers he performance might, he, he might be the best in the world right now like that's very fair <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah he i mean it goes without saying if he's the best there he's he's he really like who else would be like you know even in the finals we wouldn't take pays or or gumiyushi over this guy we'd take viper, viper in, yep. in lck so yep. i i think but jackie love has been really fucking good for like the last year and a half now like 2023 and 2024 um and he's been putting on putting on a show so i mean Jackie Love is, has been doing great. And I think JDG, like you really see it is fucking hard to win in Korea and China if you don't have a very, very complete roster. Right. And like if you, you can do well, but by the time we start hitting like the three, six nines, you know, and the knights at the top, the question is, are these solo lights like they're good, but are they good enough to win LPL? Um, and when the teams really turn on the gas in the playoffs and you have a lot of veteran players who will step up in these situations, is that is, you know, is Flandre in his current condition that guy? And I think the answer is no. So I, I think for a lot of for me, JDG, a lot of it's going to turn on whether how much Sheer can develop during summer before summer playoffs roll around. I mean, also, I think Rulers was playing way worse individually than he was last True. year. I think the ruler Which is too was bad because like, you feel like this was a ruler meta, especially with the Zeri, Zeri coming back in. Yeah, I mean, he just doesn't feel like he's the same guy that he was last year. So that's what's tough uh, for me about the the team is it felt like ruler was outclassed. Like it feels like Jackie Love and Elk are just better than Ruler right now, which is surprising because Ruler's yep. been ultra consistent. You know, like he's a player that even when he was on bad iterations of the Gen G roster, he was always like the guy, and he just doesn't look like he's the guy anymore. So hopefully that turns around for him in summer. Well, we can come back to LCK too. That'd be fine. Oh, well, speaking of veterans that create consistency there as we get to playoffs, one person who is n younger, newer, I guess newer to this spot when we compare all the names was Cream. Who, what did you make of Cream's performance here, Dom? I mean, I think he's really solid. Um, like his Ari is obviously really good. He's somebody who you need to like permaban Ari against, essentially. I mean, unless you have Knight on your team. And I guess, I guess it, when, you know, they play, if they play against Gen G. If Top Esports plays against Gen G, Chovy can also play the Ari really well, even though he didn't seem like he was favoring it that much recently. Um, I mean, I think that that Cream is a player who's became extremely stable. He went from being a like assassin only player, a melee champion only player, to being somebody who can play all the meta champions. Like you can get like his Corky was pretty sus, but Corky is just sus in China. Period. Like Chinese players just are not good. Like Chinese teams are just bad at playing Corky. Um, so yeah, I mean. I think that he's a player that can play everything in the meta. He plays like all the control mages. And then he also just has the ability. You always have to worry about counter picks. You know, if you pick a team comp with multiple good ults, he's somebody who's not afraid. Like if Silas comes back into the meta in this next, uh, at MSI, like he can play all the melee champions, like on a, a completely elite level. Yeah, I just bring him up because when you compare the list of names going to MSI from the LPL, you're familiar with all of them. If you but are he, even he like a has, casual fan. I mean, he also just has giga veterans surrounding him, right? So yeah. they can they can mind control him like with good shot calling. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it certainly helps to have players like Tian and Mako on your team to to give you a hand.
Yeah, for Mako sure. the old man on that roster there. I but, mean, uh, Mako has been insane. Like, I don't know where, like, his form looked horrible in summer, and then he just came back, and now he's, like, one of the best individual mechanical supports in the LPL, which is so crazy when you think about it. I mean, Mako is somebody who I consider, like, the greatest support of all time. If you consider the fact that this guy yeah. won MSI in 2015, he's got four titles, a world championship, and he's still good now. Like, that longevity is fucking crazy. It makes my blood boil when people try to say that like Mata is better than him all time, even though Mata has literally had like half of the career that this Mako guy has had. So, you know, yeah, it is what it is, man. That guy is really insane still. Who I, I know I asked it earlier about the finals, but who else is in that conversation? Um, Ming, I mean, I would I would like I think Karia still needs time, but he's somebody who's definitely in that conversation once he retires. I mean, world champion. I would say that that's yeah, pretty I think much. even on Mako was in that conversation a, even a couple of years ago when we did that show, Dom, with Thorin about yeah. the, the best players of all time. But I think you could make a pretty convincing argument that Mako has kind of eclipsed Mata, especially because his career just keeps going. Like you say, yeah. it's, it's wild. Yeah, I feel like people just have the um, they have like the uh, the bias towards uh, like the nostalgia bias, I guess, is what it would be considered when it comes to a player like Mata, because Mata was like really insane in season four. But if you took his career outside of season four, it really was like, oh, yeah, not... he was terrible when he went into China. When and he then, went to China, yeah. he was not good. I mean, he was good. He was good when he came back on KT, but yeah. Yeah, he was uh, good. And then when he joined SKT, you know, he's like, getting like benched for effort and shit. Like, yeah. When you consider that compared Wolf. to like a player that's won more championships, has the world, has MSI, and that has been like, like Mako has been good the whole time. Like he had like, a bad split in 2023 summer but then he's good again this split in 2023 uh, spring he was also really good with edg like he's just getting teams to top placings and he's always the person that's known as the shot caller on these teams yeah all right appreciate that thanks for the context there chat throughout the four m's someone said the four m's mako mata ming and mickey x um mm -hmm. wolf being thrown in there Mad life. Uh, whoa, crazy. No, G, get out. Boo. Yeah, Boo see, this man. <laughs> Fucking wolf, man. No way we're putting him. I mean, then we got, I he guess was, we got to put Bang in the greatest AD of all time conversation as well, then, right? Yeah, Fuck the, it, that, that SKT bot lane was gargantuan overrated. Yep. Sorry, chat. We tried. <laughs> all right. So, uh, thanks for the breakdown of that previous series let's close the chapter on jdg with this do they change anything or is it just what what needs to fix it's the form of ruler no, it's, just, it's they what don't else? have the money i don't think and like yagao is they need somebody in the top lane who can be the extra star power that they need because yagao is a wonderful supporting mid laner but like you know if if he's going to be like faker like they need a Zayas, right so sheer better be that guy if they want to win lpl yeah, I mean, I think Sheer is actually more of the tank player from what we saw. Like, he's more of the 369 style player where, I mean, not 369 now. 369 is just a fucking monster now. But, like, what JDG 369 was for the team. It, like, Flandre is the player that's supposed to be giving you more of the carry threat. Like, TF is permaban versus him, uh, for example. And all the series, it just feels like Flandre is not quite good enough. But I honestly think that the team doesn't need to change anything. They just need to play better. Like, I don't think there's like a fundamental flaw of how the team is constructed. Um, I think that the, the the thing is like their bot lane, when they were a good team, their bot lane was like the best bot lane in the world, period. So that's what I want to see like m like more of. If they can get back into that form, it's not going to matter if Laundry is not like giga smashing lanes. They'll just win games based on the fact that their players are good. All right, there you go. JDG fans, ruler fans. Those are the changes that need to be made. Let's move to prediction time. BLG top esports, not necessarily just picks, but also what to watch for. What should, where should fans' attention be? When, well, we when should talk about the, the I mean, the, the last series does play into this, right? Because it was a really fucking crazy series with a really crazy ending. Yep. <laughs> yeah. With like, I mean, the, the, the BLG the bin twisted sports. fate backdoor. <laughs> that was, that was a banger series. That was a banger series. And I think really that good. also. That just showed like what BLG's strengths are and also what their potential weaknesses are as a team, like their propensity to kind of like throw some leads. I mean, they play extremely different than Genji, which is why I would love to see that matchup. Not only is it Knight versus Chovy, but when you look at like 
how BLG plays. They play hard through bot lane early. Like they play bot lane matchups in some of the most crazy ways you'll ever see. Like Camille, uh, their, their first game where they go Camille, Callista into Draven. And everyone is like, okay, Draven Thresh into Camille, Callista. It's not a good matchup for Camille because your E can be flayed by the Thresh. So the Camille E can be flayed by the Thresh, so it's hard for Camille to engage. So they just start W level one on Camille and they just insta heal for movement speed, walk up and it just, it just ignite W and get two sums out of nowhere. It's like, what the fuck? I didn't even know that matchup could play out like that. You know, like when you watch BLG bot lane, they teach you how matchups should be played. The way they play like Callista, Renata, it's absolutely nuts. Like the way that they play like their early lane phase, the way they push into dive, like they are a team that just absolutely smurfs on people early. They really just like are able to find angles to stack bot waves, play hard through it and just dive over and over. So that's what I love about the, the team. On the other side of things, I feel like top esports is um like they're interesting because they've gotten better macro wise, but now 369 is becoming like a, a legitimate carry threat. Like he's playing Aatrox, he's playing Urgot. I mean, he just looks really fucking good on everything now. So when you watch this matchup, it's like, it's really interesting. I love it. Yeah, his rumble's been really good this year too. Like yeah. game clutching good. Uh, I, I appreciate that, the, you know, Top Esports was trying things, too, in the finals. Like, you know, they went back to what Keen was doing last year on KT, which is like the occasional like Quinn counterpick into Renekton. I think that's extremely difficult to pull off outside of the work. laning phase. <laughs> I mean, the thing is also like Bin is one of the best players in the world at playing hard matchups into range champions as a melee champion. And this is especially uh true when you watch him play his jacks like a lot of the counters to jacks used to be things like kennen kennen was like a huge counter but he's really good at spacing ben is really good at spacing and he's very good at understanding like wave control and brush control in in, in a lot of these matchups so i feel like he's just the wrong guy to try to quinn versus renekton counter counterpick <laughs> you can do that to somebody you can't do it to him like maybe you try that versus like keen or something like i feel like keen could be more susceptible to to losing out that side of the matchup, but Ben is like made his living playing melee champs in extremely hard matchups because he used to just blind carries all the time. It's also just, unless you get an insane Quinn advantage, just really hard to actually play out a game because your objective control goes to shit. So you have to play have like to really push. well. Yeah. And, or play picks play for picks, right? Which is what KT did with the pick with with Quinn last year was like play around vision around objectives and just get isolated fights. Um, but it's tough, even in those situations. And team fighting with Quinn is a fucking nightmare. Even though Keen is good at it, it still is an uphill battle, right? So it was just fun. Like I, I enjoyed seeing that that moment um within the series like i enjoy we got to see like the two sides of the Jackie Love Draven, which was super entertaining. Like it's actually crazy the advantage that he got in game four. Um, and then it, it had a really wild ending. If you guys haven't seen it with like, you know, base, base cancels and everything. So Bin can get in on the twisted fate and just like barely win the game, especially because he he's like autoing down a turret that has a TP going to it. And it the, the TP was like 0.1 seconds from completing. Uh, and mm -hmm. then he kills the turret, cancels the TP, and then gets the end on the game. So it's about as exciting an ending to a game five as you can watch. Um, but really, this series was balanced on a razor's edge. But to your point, Dom, about the bot lane of BLG, that has been Genji's weakness. So, like, I can totally see B BLG winning a series by playing the bot lane like that because Pays and Lehens have been kind of ass in lane for most of the year. Um, mm -hmm. and that, that's going to strike directly at that, at the weakness of Genji, I think. Yep. Yeah. I mean, they both have like opposite strengths and opposite weaknesses. So that's like the interesting part about the Genji versus, versus, uh, uh, Genji versus BLG matchup. Like, is it like macro or is it like early game fighting diving? And I think BLG has, has kind of had a similar style last year. Um, and that's why BLG last year did end up beating Genji in two best of fives. Yeah, they did get to play twice, right? Yep, twice. Yep. The fear is that they don't get to play twice this time. That would stink. Uh, hopefully, uh, we're able to get that matchup. Um, it should be almost impossible. It should be almost impossible with how they change things. Yeah. Mm. 
All right. Because BLG now, top. like, the teams are on opposite sides of the bracket, so you can't get the Civil Wars in semis. Yeah. So, like, All it right. would take, like, BLG or Gen.G losing to, like, a Western team or something. Probable. Could happen. It could. Who knows? Happen. Probably, it actually can't happen. Not. I think it's almost impossible. I mean, they could be uh, on the same side of the bracket, right? Oh, no, they won't be, potentially. It depends on the seeding, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it'll depend. So if, if Billy Billy wins, uh, then they would be on opposite sides of the bracket, and that makes it very difficult. If Billy Billy gets second place, then they could yeah. meet in potentially, like, semis. One loses, and they meet again in grand finals. That's how it could happen. Yeah. Also, I mean, you just know they're going to be scrim partners, though. I mean, everyone's going to scrim everyone, especially the top teams. But you assume that the Eastern teams are going to scrim each other, so they'll 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 have had. They might already be scrimming each other. They might have already been scrimming each other for months. Who knows? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, all right. Who who you got in this, and 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 why? Who you got in this? And I have why? no idea. <laughs> Dumb. <laughs> I've got BLG three one, mainly because the of the balling. Oh. Yeah, I think the bot lane is. I think the the top esports they normally win through their bot lane being good. Yeah, but like what happens if their bot lane is not good? What happens if their bot lane actually gets dominated? I think that they're they were lucky to win two games in the last series. I think that if uh, BLG just has a more solid draft strategy now that they've played top esports, yeah, that once, kindred pick was them. really garbage. <laughs> yeah, as yeah, good as really it is at that pick, the kindred one. in game four was the fucking terrible. Yeah, it was really bad. Like playing Kindred, like with both with the comp that they had, and then also against Gragas and Tristana was like really weird. For sure, a- a- anti synergy for sure. Um, hmm. All right. Well, another big series to close out the spring split. A a, a rematch of the upper bracket finals. And a good one to watch. Keep the eye on the bot lane, as Adam had said, and see if they draft, uh, if Top Esports can draft a little bit more synergy out there. And uh, no, no Quinn. No Quinn into the Renekton. <laughs> um, yep. All right, guys. Boom. There you have it. Uh, a long show. Despite them trying to stop us, we kept going. DDoS, <laughs> all the cuts, all that stuff. Thanks for sticking <laughs> around through all of that. Um, Dom, you just got uh, the LPL finals. What else do you have on your plate? Anything else? Nothing much. I'm doing uh, CB Law finals as well. Same oh, sweet. Day. Yep. Sweet, sweet, sweet. Monty, what do you got? Uh, I, I, I'm just probably going to not be doing much next week. We don't have a show next week, guys, just so you know. Uh, we'll be back for a little MSI preview week afterwards, but I'll be preparing to come back to the United States for a month. So probably just mostly doing family stuff and that. Yeah. I'm leaving LA as I've posted in Twitter. It's been uh, a good run. It was a little expensive. Things were a little too slow for me. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy for all the friends relationships I've made. I, I was, I was having dinner with Han- Hanser, who he and a couple of other friends. And I was like, you know, we've done this for seven years and, you know, you think about everyone that you've met and all that stuff, and it, it's been been a really great run. But uh, uh, leaving LA and next is TBD. But uh, been it's been. Sorry, you'll be you'll be happier for it. Uh, I, I'm sure Dom will say the same thing. Yes. Anti anti LA club right here. <laughs> yeah. It's just not worth it. Like you have to be like going out to like Hollywood fucking clubs permanently to make it semi worth it. It was, yeah, it was worth it when I was doing that. It was then it, it, it you know, priorities kicked on in. So uh, thanks for everyone who I got to meet along the road and on that stuff. It, it really means a lot. And uh, but we'll continue to fire up episodes here at the best place for you to learn about lol esports across the world. If you haven't already, please take this moment now to subscribe to our channels, whether you're watching on uh, Inside on Esports on Twitch or on all of our last Free Nation channels across all other platforms so you don't miss anything. All right. Enjoy the weekend of finals before we get into MSI, and we'll have a new episode of Power Spike in two weeks. Until then, take care and see ya.